Good morning. Good morning. Hello, Hi guys. Good morning, everybody. Is, it, is everyone Hi. here? Do you want? Do you mind turning on your cameras for a bit so that we can see you, so that the guys also can see you, the juries? Here we go. Oh, Basil's okay. got a very, very professional setup for the for the finals. I see. Nice. Uh, <laughs> just copying you, yeah. <laughs> you have a more professional headset, I guess. Uh, you know, uh, Oana and I, we have we're like a mission control, so we yeah. have to, we have to have the the headsets you know, to, <laughs> to to run the whole space space situation. And we, I see that also some um, some pieces from the from yesterday's group. Now, Wapan, thanks, nice for thanks for joining us. Uh, there we are. Most Great. of the people are here, no? We are missing one person from the most branded group. <laughs> We're missing uh, who? Uh, we're missing Herman we're and missing Amal, Herman. no? And Amal too. Ah, yeah. Okay. But oh, uh, they they can join it anytime, hopefully very soon. Yeah, sure. Let's try to keep this on time because that, that way the last group doesn't suffer from from going overboard. Maybe this, the, some of the juries will have to leave uh, on time. So let's stick to the clock guys you know it's a like 10, 10 minutes presentation 10 to 12 minutes and then a 15 to 18 minutes review time from um well there's always going to be four to five people uh, around here to to discuss the projects which is going to be really nice um maybe let me start by introducing the the juries which is uh, for us of course a pleasure to have such a uh lovely mixed of talents in the panel. Um, so first of all, I, I'm going to go with the order that I have in the screen. In order of appearance, I have uh, Julian Hull from, from uh, Design Technologies in Herzog in the Mirren. Uh, Julian is an old friend of mine, also a former colleague of mine in, uh, in iTech in Stuttgart, and now he's part of the, of the Design Technologies team in Herzog, uh, and also a BIM manager. So He'll be keeping an eye on that side of the projects for sure. Uh, you want to say something, Jules? Or hello, everybody. No, I'm I'm very honored to be here and see those interesting projects. I'm very yeah curious what's 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 going to happen today today in the morning. Thanks for having me. An honor to have you, uh, for sure. Uh, next we have uh, Srinka Radic from uh, Saha. A uh, there's, there she is. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. And yeah, I'm looking forward to see the presentation. I was also in IAC a couple of years ago. So I'm excited to see what you guys have been up to. Thanks a lot for joining us. It's also an honor to have you. Um, uh, she's an architect and beam designer also in Saha. But uh, she's also interested in, in, in complex modeling and parametric modeling, as far as I remember from, from her work in IAC. So she'll be keen on watching that aspect of the projects for sure. Um, we have also Octavian Georgiou. I, I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> he's, a, he's an associate at Forsters and Partners and also a lecturer at the UECL Bartlett. And he's got a lot of background also um, on the off-world projects coming from uh, the uh, SMG group in Fosters and also working tangentially with Xavier in, in, in Hassel. Uh, you want to say something, Octavian? Oh, thanks for the invitation. I'm looking forward to see everyone's projects. And good luck today. Enjoy it. It's your day. Thanks a lot for coming. And uh, Finally, we have uh, Kike Garcia from, from McNeil. Uh, he's the developer of Rhino Insight there, Rhino Insight Revit, uh, Rhino Insight, but also more, I think more focused in Revit now, right, Kike? Um, he's also a former colleague of mine in, in McNeil up to, up to recently. And he'll be on the lookout of the, for, for that aspect of the projects, I think. Uh, he's very interested in seeing how, how we have managed to bring comp uh, Kind of uh, complex geometries into this workflow, uh, non-standard uh, geometries into this Revit workflow. I think that's an interesting aspect. You want to say something, Kike? Well, just give you thank you about inviting me and let me be here. It's it's always a pleasure. <laughs> uh, we also have uh, uh, Xavier de Castellier, who is going to join us in the uh, in an hour or so. 
he he said he's he was gonna be a he's gonna be here around eleven. Um, I will introduce him anyhow. He's he's the principal director of uh, Hassel, uh, which uh, is actually the the maker of some of the projects that you have been including in your in your in your projects as a, as a reference. So I think uh, we, we're all aware of the work that they've done in 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 off world uh, type of projects, and it's going to be a pleasure to have him as well. Um, so the way we're going to go about this is that I'm going to start briefly um, introducing the studio with a little brief that I've prepared that, that talks a little bit about what we aim to do. Um, the research, the initial research, research that we put out in common, uh, because there's some part of the work that all of the students did as a group. And I'm going to be presenting that for, for them so that they don't spend so much time in, the, of the, in that on their presentation. And then we're gonna just jump into their projects one by one with a, hopefully with a quick break in, in the middle. Uh, so if you guys are ready, we can just uh, launch the, the mission. <laughs> as you, this, this is going to be full of um, lunar jokes and puns, so we, I hope you guys are ready for this. Huh? <laughs> um, so I'm going to start by by sharing my my presentation here, my my screen. Hey, oh, and I don't know if you want to add something. Am I forgetting something? I think we are good to go. I pasted the link to the to the live um, stream in the chat and you can all share with uh, whoever you think is interested to join or to 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 watch and i think we can get this started friends families uh brothers cousins your 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 bosses so that you can give an excuse to what you where you're here um <laughs> maybe i forgot to introduce the oh Anna, i will i was going to do this in the presentation but oh, Anna Taut, she's the ma cat coordinator uh, but also um, the uh, faculty assistant for this studio, but also a, a computational expert, uh, spe especially in the side in the side of art artificial intelligence. I will talk about more about that in the, in the presentation that I'm going to show you in a minute now. So mm -hmm. um, here we go. It, it's nice to to meet the jury, and uh, for the students, it, it's very nice to be finally here at this celebration point. So let's all enjoy. <clears throat> okay, so there we go. This is the, um, I hope you guys can see my screen and hear me. Is that, is that so? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, we'll okay great. Um, so this, welcome again to the, to the, um, a BIM and Smart Construction Studio of the Master in Advanced Computation for Architecture and Design. Uh, I'm just going to spend two minutes telling you what the uh, master uh, is about. So the, uh, MACAT, as we like to call it, is a, is a rather unique accredited online master program uh, that aims to train new, a, generation, a new generation of, arch of architects, engineers, and designers with uh, skills that are now in demand in the AEC industry. Um, the program is divided into three modules plus a thesis project in the end. Uh, we have already gone into, through the first module in October to December. Uh, we are finishing the second module, which is about building information modeling and smart construction right now. And uh, here we are in the in the BIM in the BIM, in BIM SC studio. And we're about to start the next uh, module in April, June, which is about artificial intelligence in architecture. So we have this, all, all of these different seminars and we co cover all of these different topics in the, in the masters. Uh, this is our first edition uh, ever. <laughs> um, and uh, so far I have to say, we're super pleased about the work, uh, the work and effort of our students and the, and, the, and the kind of collaboration that we're establishing, not only with the students, but with, the, with faculties uh, across the globe. Um, I am the program director and also up, uh, recently the head of computational design in IAC. Uh, I also teach in the MAA1 uh, um, master's program in the, within the Digital Matters Studio alongside with Areti Marco Polo. And also uh, uh, with me, uh, we have Oana Taut, who is a MACAD coordinator, but also our faculty assistant and a computational expert uh, um, especially on the side of, of AI. 
uh, but now also assisting in this uh, seminar. Um, I want to start by by just quickly talking about where and what did we set out to do with the with the studio. I hope I'm not. I'm just going to try to go as quick as I can, so I don't steal time from the from the students. So um, I borrowed this this nice graph of by the Gini belt that kind of explains a little bit the the levels of beam, so that we can just sort of map out uh, where do we uh, what kind of topics are we addressing in the studio. So. Uh, on the one hand side, we're, we're dealing with the more canonical topics of BIM, which is uh, a integrative modeling or bringing uh, project documentation that all, that always includes plans, budgets, and schedules, and and 3D geometries, and of course uh, uh, time uh, time schedules, uh, um, which is actually de depicted here up to level three. Uh, but more focused on the more uh, recent technologies and paradigms of cloud ba uh, cloud based data management, uh, which has to do more with bringing uh, uh, sharing geometries uh, and converting them into data which you can actually um, interface and, and and transport in the uh, in the web for instance uh, that's one of our seminars. We also uh, deal with collaborative workflows, which is an important part of our of our studio inter collaboration among the many agents of design. And also interoperability, which is uh, to be able to transfer data from different different software. Um, we just very quickly. This is the challenge that we the challenges that we set out to to tackle. So, how to design projects so that they are able to adapt to the various changes of the design development process? Uh, quite um, quite neatly depicted here by the McLeany curve, which I think is something that most of you have already seen how an architectural project actually becomes more difficult to change the more developed it becomes. And um, then also how to collaborate robustly and freely and in real time between the different agents of the design process. Um, the agents in this particular case being our, our students. These in the pictures are not our students. I should have actually probably should have placed pictures of our students here inter-collaborating in the, in the map, but uh, that's, gonna, that's gonna happen in, in the practical level. And then how to transfer architectural information along the many softwares that are out there. Um, the time, the timeline that we set out to 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 uh, propose for the studio was actually we, we wanted to start first by placing the projects and developing a, a debris of our projects in the in the site. Um, then the, uh, spend most of the time developing the projects while documenting them in parallel, so that we can actually. Um, uh, get entangled with this with this um, paradigm of early uh, early design uh, or, or design in early stages of the project, and then in the end, uh, spend some time on, on representation, the proper representation, communication of the projects, and also developing a web interface, if possible, where the where where the projects could be uh, accessed by people on the web. In reality, uh, the the site placement, which uh, in the end turned out to be the collaborative curvative work turned out to be a, a, an aspect that we developed throughout the whole studio um, because it took it kind of it was a challenge that was kind of larger than than the one that we set out to that we thought in the beginning um, so the first part of the studio it's about was about choosing the sites and uh, for a site in this particular uh, term we choose the moon and uh, in the words of uh, JFK I think no one could put it more nicely we go to the moon because it's hard and because the goals will serve us to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills that's uh, from from a little speech from jfk but in the practical level it actually would force us to create bespoke components for for from non-standard projects uh, it will provide a unique opportunity for storytelling a uh, freedom of design and program within specific constraints and um, it will allow uh, students to exercise research abilities and create and creativity to challenge problems uh, also providing a unique aesthetic, uh, aesthetic quality to the projects and of course it's a it's definitely a, a trending topic nowadays so it's a it's a plausible challenge for the for the near future you know and most of all it has been it, 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 we, we thought it would be fun and it has been fun to 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 be dealing with with uh, off-world projects for sure um, so initially we we proposed a site uh, me and Oana we picked a site rather randomly in the beginning which was the Batavius crater but our students wouldn't take that as a as a site and started kind of uh, digging out uh, and researching a lot of uh, um, in-depth information about which would be the most uh, the best suitable site for the for the projects to be 
uh, uh, situated in. So this is just a couple of images that I took from my from our Slack uh, channel, and uh, eventually the students come, came up with a nice presentation, uh, kind of argument argumenting which would be the best site for the projects to be located in. Uh, finally, um, finally uh, settling the projects in the so-called Shackleton crater. For those, I think most. Uh, uh, most inclined into the lunar design. I think this is probably a, a well-known site uh, for me that I wasn't that much in, uh, uh, aware of this. It was kind of a surprise. But of course, they argumented this with a lot of uh, background information uh, regarding the uh, slope of the site, the, the solar uh, incidents uh, that the projects would have, uh, the slope versus illumination that the projects would have, uh, the site topography, um, there was a lot of information that they found, including a, a nice 3D model, which are they, they're all using as a base for the project development. And from that, they also picked, uh, they could start picking a, a more refined uh, site because this is, uh, as you see, kind of like, this is rather, I think, uh, a couple of hundred kilometers long. So they, take, they, they picked a more specific site from this, uh, which would be the most suitable for the, for the projects to be located in according to many different um, parameters that they chose. So here are the, the proposed the initial proposed locations. And in the end, they, they pick uh, G1 because uh, having more advantages, of course, and disadvantages in the end. So we changed kind of the, the site of the brief to the Shackleton crater, which uh, uh, was uh, and whose, um, and this decision was sort of validated by, by uh, also the, the space agencies, which uh, thought this would be a, a good idea. The program uh, for the program, we we uh, we dealt uh, a few suggestions for the type of program that would be nice to have in a colony in the moon. So um, some of the, uh, so the, the groups um, have to say that they have been working in groups. So we have actually six groups in the sync uh, in the sync uh, group, which is the ones that we're looking at now, and we have four groups in the async uh, group which is the ones that had the presentation yesterday, because uh, maybe I failed to say that the masters, because the masters is a worldwide, um, it's kind of worldwide ambitious. We aim to, to provide education for students uh, worldwide. So we have to divide the, the group, the students in two groups, some that then can join in the morning for time zones reasons, some that can join in the afternoon. And the, the group in the morning is the sync group, which is the larger one with six, uh, Groups. The group in the afternoon, which is the one that, that we reviewed yesterday, is the async group with four groups. So each of the groups picked up a, a program and then then started researching about that program, with the mission to build a permanent colony on the moon that can sustain up to a hundred settlers, settlers to begin with. That was the main purpose of the of the of the of the study in the beginning. Uh, and we started with a, we wanted to start with a challenge with a, so we we. We imposed the challenge to the students instead of actually prescribing a defined master plan for the projects to be located in. We wanted to deal with it, with the aspect of interoperability in more in, like, in more like a self organized way. So we, uh, instead of uh, giving them the, the the location of the projects, we gave them some rules for settlement, in which they would have to interact among each other uh, to to place the projects. And then, and thus forcing them to, in a way, uh, intercommunicate among them and share their projects, geometries, their initial intentions, by different means. Which means that they would actually have to research and explore, uh, explore themselves, in spite of, of course, uh, being taught on these topics in parallel on the other seminars. Uh, the only, the only rule. I mean, we had these three rules for settlement, but the most important rule was that there would be no centralization allowed. So, not, no one person. Picking the the, the the location for the six projects and 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 come going with that, it was more like you would have to you know place your project and communicate with the rest of the projects to to figure out if their rules are being fulfilled. So uh, they they came up with some really nice attempts in the beginning to parameterize this and uh, use, for example, parametrical models, um, dynamical models uh, in the beginning, like uh, for example, collision-based models with kangaroo to see. How would the projects configure in the, with the different areas that they had? Um, and then they, they quickly figure out that they they it would be difficult to to actually share this. And there we go. 
to, to share this among everyone. So they actually, their first attempt for inter collaboration was actually to, to place their information in a Google spreadsheet, their location information in a, in a Google spreadsheet and have a grasshopper definition reading this spreadsheet and, and thus being aware of the location of every other project. Uh, which uh, turned out to be kind of a difficult task because of, of asynchronicity, pretty much. Um, mainly, the, the one of the biggest uh, uh, issues or challenges here was that they, they also had to deal with working in the two separate groups. So not only the sync and the async group uh, were working on their own groups, but they were working as a whole, you know, the 10 projects all together. That means actually that some the proposal of some of the students made on one day the students on the next group would read on the next day you know so it was uh, a lot of asynchronicity happened and then i think it was an interesting challenge to begin with so there was in some attempts ups also of, of a bit of uh, initial proposals and centralization and in the end they came up with a rather specific uh, they had to come up with a rather specific uh, spreadsheet where they would define the projects that they would uh, want to be connected with uh, the, the, this, the area of the projects, the distance of the, uh, from one project to the other, and eventually uh, using Speckle, which is one of the two tools that we teach in the seminar, to, to organize this uh, in a more coordinated way. So here is one, just one of the uh, snapshots of them using Speckle, like the different streams from the different groups, so that they would be all sort of coordinated in locations to, to fulfill the rules. Um, at the end, uh, this was what it turned to be the different um, disposition of the projects in the context. They would be connected in such a way, one to the other. Um, uh, our intention was in the beginning to create some sort of like a transportation network uh, infrastructure in between the projects, which, which would, we thought it would look something like this, you know, like a network uh, where the project would communicate underground. Um, turns out that the underground in the moon we learned yesterday that it's not such a good idea from a, from a Advanit who was a space expert. But in any case, this was rather a conceptual idea of the projects being interconnected. And this is their final geometries being, being streamed in Speckle in the community. And this is actually the final uh, disposition of the projects and how they look like, like now. So on the, on the, on the red, um, on slide red, you can see the projects from the sink group the products the projects that we're going to see now and in oops and in um, in blue you can see the other projects from the async group i think that's a little mistake here it's, no, it's probably it's going to be this is group nine but but in any case this is the final disposition of the projects and this is how it kind of looks like in 3d and um, i think that's enough of me and enough of the introduction uh, i hope i made this on time because uh, to leave enough time, not to steal enough time from the from the students, uh, this is the general work that we did together uh, from the beginning of the studio till the end. This is something that we continuously worked on, and I want to really commend the students for this effort, which hasn't been easy to coordinate. Um, um, having said that, I think we can just give food to the uh, to the to the first group. So, is that correct? So we have actually built a little schedule for, for, the, for, the, for the session, and we're gonna start with our sports facility group, which should be sharing the screen right now, no? Sports facility or oh, group one? I think we're research. starting with the research facility. Research, oh, yeah, I just, I just wanted to know how, how awake you were, guys. No, thanks, uh, um, you're, you're up. Okay, um, sorry, I, I mean. No, no. You it's, know, this smooth transition. <laughs> yeah, I, I blew it. <laughs> I blew it. So, guys, um, take it away, and uh, please start by introducing yourselves and keep an eye on the clock. Okay. Of course, Andre, please request sharing screen. Uh, yep, yep. Can you guys hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear yeah, Alexander very, very low. So, Alexander, if you want to uh, turn up your volume in the meantime. I'll and try to speak louder than. Good. <laughs> and Alex, maybe hit the present button. So, pray. Of course. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jury, for joining us. My name is Andrei. I'm from Group One. I'm here with Yara and Alexander. 
and we have been working on construction of a hospital and a research center in our beautiful moon settlement. Um, so this is a quick overview of what's uh, what's on the table for tonight, for to this morning, I should say. Oops, I jumped a bit too quick. So let me quickly explain our mission. I think I don't need to explain you why Moon Colony needs a hospital. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but we do need a, also a research center, and that's where it gets interesting. And we got our name, Athenaeum Lunaris. Athenaeum is a Latin word for institution that promotes literary or scientific learning. And so uh, given this whole BEAM agenda, we provide, we our facility provides uh, collaboration between all the players um, of the Moon Colony to conduct research in various fields and propel humanity forward. And also to give you a quick overview of our inner collaboration, we have been using Speckle as a stream and we made several branches where we would, we would exchange information and data between each other. Alex was uh, in charge of uh, Generate, generating the matching through the space syntax matrix, which we later, which we used to generate the shell through kangaroo and send geometry to Revit through Rhino inside, something we've been learning this semester. So this is kind of tying all the classes in together. And this is our location. This is us on the moon. We're quite small as a, as a building. And I think that speaks about our humbleness and uh, resourcefulness, if I may say so. Um, and here you see a better overview, a nice little sketch drawing of our colony. Um, and yeah, these are our connections to the colony. We have the public LNS, which uh, David has been working on. And we also have a rover entrance to communicate with our neighbors and uh, do moon research. I'll now pass it to Alex to talk about the space function. Space uh, good morning. So, uh, as um, as to deal with uh, the initial requirements set by David and Juana to keep uh, our our design as flexible as, and parametric as possible, we decided to use space syntax uh, as a uh, generative tool. Uh, so, the first thing we did was specified uh, the initial program for the hospital and uh, research center. Then we specified all the data needed for the space syntax script. So all the relations in between stories, in between the rooms. And uh, then we took it uh, to Grasshopper. We, we, our main goal was to keep everything uh, as easy to input as possible. So as you can see, this is the only thing that you need to input to Grasshopper to make our script work. Um, and then I will quickly go through uh, the logic of the script. So the first thing is we input the room areas. We specify the connection lines between the functions that are supposed to be connected together. Uh, we specify the lengths of the connections. We run the kangaroo solver. Then after the kangaroo solver uh, sphere uh, collision is done, we run another, uh, another script to create rooms clean those rooms, create, merge the clusters, and then finally uh, generate the floor plans. At this point, I just wanted to very, very briefly show you how this script is working. So just to see how easy this is. So we, in, uh, this is a, a grasshopper in cloud using the Heroku app server, uh, where you can see the outcomes of the space syntax with uh, also the ability to move certain function, like this is uh, the function of the vertical communication that you can move in the app and everything will change. Then you can, after, after you specify all those things, you can change uh, display mode to floor plans. And as you can see, uh, all the floor plans are generated. We can keep them divided, we can merge them. And also, we have a script that generates the corridors for our function. And the whole idea for the script is that we keep it um, parametric. So at any time, any point of time, we can change the area of any room. We can, in this case, we can just scale up the area to see what happens with the function distribution if the area will be scaled two, two times. Um, 
Okay, it's been a little bit too long, so I'm going to continue the presentation. Um, uh, then, uh, mm, uh, then we took uh, the uh, iteration of the script that we like most. Uh, we generated the geometry. We use Speckle to share this geometry within our group. Uh, we send it to Revit, and but this will be uh, talked about later. Then we focus on the structural part of our design as our, uh, as our space syntax script uh, is creating uh, a various geometry. We wanted to keep uh, the structural gen generation automatic as well. So we lean, lean, we lean towards uh, the topological optimization using the topos plugin, where we specify the initial boundaries for the solver, then we can see highlighted loads. Uh, then you can see the extracted analytical, analytical mesh, which we later refined and pushed to Revit. And uh, here you can see how the process of uh, the topological optimization could be 3D printed um, in our site. As, and also, as you can see, the foundations are, uh, are connected to the terrain. And right here, I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Andrei. Thank you. So using, using the massing geometry and information, we later generated a shell um, through Kangaroo by inflating a mesh, as you can see here. And uh, this next slide, which doesn't seem to click for me. Uh, oh, there you go. Um, this next slide, you can see how the process of uh, remeshing and how um, the mesh is adjusted to the terrain to fill the terrain nicely. Oops, I jumped a bit too far. So we ran a quick Car Caramba test. Um, Caramba, I'm sure most of you are aware, it's a structural analysis software, a uh, plugin, sorry. And we, we wanted to see how the panels would perform. And you can see from the diagram on the right that the most, most of the displacement comes on, on the top. Um, and this, this gave us a, even though the displacement was only one centimeter, this gave us a good understanding of what to do next. And so what we did was we generated uh, varying uh, in thickness panels, um, uh, ranging from 22 centimeters down to 10 centimeters on the, on the top, which provides both um, more optimized structure and more um, a wider window at the top. And you can also see the rover entrance on the left, which um, the rovers will be coming in and out to exchange resources with the neighbors, but also for the moon and its terrain and collect samples. Now, Yara will tell you all about our documentation and how we move data into Revit. Yeah, hi everyone. So in this slide, i uh, just like to summarize uh, what my colleagues, uh, Anjay and Alex were explaining about. Um, so basically, the two aspects of the, of the project, the space syntax and the structural envelope elements um, outputs, were now at this stage uh, start to emerge to the documentation uh, phases, where we here, as we can see, um, uh, documented in Revit uh, via um, Rhino Insight. Next slide, please. So these are the floor plans generated uh, from Revit. Um, and while I go through the floor plans, I'm just gonna like highlight the main uh, functions for each floor plan. So um, as, the, as a result of the space syntax, we merged the two programs as a hospital and a research center. And in the level zero zero, we can just see the, um, the ER or the emergent needs for the public. And as for the, um, the lab uh, research center is the rovers and the loading uh, from the LNS connections. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and here on this floor is just the daily basic needs for the patients, which is the clinics and the uh, surgical uh, rooms, as well as the, for the prototype and for the lab. Um, next slide, please. On the third floor, we can see um, kind of the medical staff as well as the, um, the, uh, the scientist um, office areas where we have a common kind of uh, programming between the two functions. Um, next slide, please. And the, um, the, th the third or the first uh, last floor is um, more um, into a, a recovery or observatory uh, patient areas, um, as well as um, um, different uh, lab research um, functions as the data center. 
and the signal uh, receiving areas. Uh, next slide, please. And as you can see here is the sections um, where we can see the different uh, elements of the um, building envelope in terms of the panels or even the regular 3D printed uh, uh, skeleton. Next slide, please. Um, an overview of the elevations um, um, as a production of the Revit and uh, all the collaborative work from Speckle and receiving the data. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and this slide just um, to further have a uh, detail um, for the project, we just we wanted to implement more um, reflected ceiling uh, elements. And um, as you can see here, we just wanted to use the, uh, the ceiling um, to embed like more structural or uh, building um, component as lighting or um, AC or ducts um, and, and so on. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, and the last slide for the rivet documentation is an exploded ISO. As you can see here, it just summarizes the uh, component for the building um, from the envelope until the slabs, um, until the ceiling uh, plans. Next slide, please. And passing it back to Andrea. Thank you, Yara. So early on in this mess, we've done a bunch of research um, about how we can fabricate and construct our projects. Um, and so we found all these metals and non-metals, non-metal elements. Um, all of these can be found within the lunar regolith and they, um, they're written here in order of uh, difficulty of extraction. And this is just to refer to later when we get deeper into the construction. We've also done more research about how we can manufacture glass. And in fact, it's possible with the same lunar regolith through um, susceptor assisted microwave oven heating. Uh, and so doing, doing so um, limits um, uh, and reduces the solar radiation and it has protective qualities, which is, which is very useful and necessary for us. In the next slide, you will see our over construction overview um, so the shell will be as in the shell panels will be constructed to use uh, using all different alloys uh, found within within lunar regolith and it will be done through the liquefaction process and then cast it and then the core skeleton can be 3d printed using the centering process using the same lunar lunar solar lunar regolith and here is just uh, showing some when animations of the frames being assembled slowly but steadily. So the first step of construction is assembling, putting all the frames together. Um, and the next step is inserting all the panels. And finally, in the third step, once we have the outer shell, the construction becomes easier because everything becomes indoor with the air inside and much more Earth-like as opposed to building on the moon and. Uh, in an airless uh, space vacuum space. And, and as we are leaning to the end of the presentation, here we prepared a short set of visualization, uh, starting with a short, uh, a short overview video of uh, of the form, uh, put in uh, put into the context of uh, of the moon colony, uh, and. Yeah. Just watch, and this is the end of the presentation. It will be also, also followed by a few interior renders and outer renders. I'm missing some Brian Eno music here in the video, guys. Oh yes, I'm super sorry for <laughs> lack of the music. Like we would like, it would be much better. No, but it's, like, we, it's we, okay. We tried to, you know, we tried to not put such high pitched music as it was last yesterday for like one group. It was super overpowering. So we are sorry for this. <clears throat> in a way, it's uh, more it's more realistic. It's a it's a sound you would hear in space, no? Yeah, like nobody can hear our screams while we're finishing the project in space. <laughs> yeah, but this is this is the end. Like uh, right now, we would just like to thank you so much uh, for all your attention. And here are just a few extra shots with a cat from the Noah's garden on the table.
<laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks for the really uh, nice presentation, guys. It's uh, and the visuals in the end were were a kick. I have to say. Yes, maybe you can you can leave the uh, like two three yeah. Um, that was super nice. Yeah. One of the in either this or one of the interiors while we we talk about the project. Uh, whichever you whichever you like actually. We can skip for them like during them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so let's. Um, Let's uh, hear what they have to say for the juries. I, I, I just want to say, um, also for, for the jury side, um, let's keep it, you know, let's keep the, competition, the, the conversation open, but also kind of to the point in the, in the interest of time. We want to hear your opinion, of course, of everyone. So who wants to, who wants to give the first shot? I can start. <laughs> Go for it. You don't mind. Congrats Absolutely. on the presentation. I really, I really like the project. I also want to say in general, I'm quite um, impressed how the whole team and the entire actually group work together that David uh, showed at the beginning and how you have these rules of settlement. And it was really, really nice how you really did this kind of master plan all by yourself and everyone in different parts of the world, but you really, had it like a lot of thoughts and you really looked at the connection. So I think if we were to really do this project, this would definitely be the workflow. So I like this a lot. But for the this project specifically, as you were presenting, I I had like a lot of questions when you were showing the structure. I was wondering where the materials, but then it seemed that in the end you really thought about that as well and you explained and I'm not sure if I understood correctly but you would get all the materials from from the moon right so you were talking about this glass that can be lunar glass is this something that can really be done so uh, that that would, that would be the goal. Um, of course, there are some limitations and constraints, given that some some things require like those elements um, that are very hard to extract from the lunar regolith, um, and maybe maybe it would be wiser and more resourceful to to bring those from Earth in some small quantities. Yeah. But the I mean the research that we've conducted suggests that. Uh, it's possible to design the whole thing with um, everything that's found within lunar regolith on the moon. Mm -hmm. But also there was one of the sections at the end where you showed, uh, and I think it really looked nice because you could see a lot of light coming in. And when you think about hospital, it's a place that no one really wants to be, but then you kind of try to make it as uh, nice as possible. So I think that's... Uh, the idea of using the material is very nice. I'm wondering if it's possible to maybe control different opacities with this material. Maybe it would be interesting to look at uh, different like transparencies and using different panels at, at certain parts. And then, you know, they're more opaque and more transparent. Uh, and then another thing is that I'd like to see a bit more because you were talking a lot about how you were getting this data into Revit and you you showed a lot of uh, program function and you like you really researched the floor plans and the program but I'd like to see a bit more how you because your whole structure is made of panels maybe you can explore a bit more how, how like the the, the type of the panels and maybe they can be optimized and that you can have uh, less different ones um, like to show maybe these things how you how you would really make them but other than that I, I think you did a lot of research and it's a nice project so congrats thank you thank you so thank much thank you very much thank you. thanks Serenka I you think I up. can go next. Um, so well done on the presentation. It was well structured and quite clear. Um, I think you have to make a choice at some point as well on um, 
and I understand his um, master's program focus very much on technical aspects, but you know, if you present in academic way, you have to also work a bit on the discourse. And, and this is something also that you need to transition also in professional life as well. So it is very interesting to talk about the technical part, but use it as a way to explain what it enables you to do that otherwise you wouldn't be able to, right? And I think that's where, for me, a bit, uh, you're missing a big part of what you do could enable, right? So you, you definitely, by the skills you've developed, you manage to do something that otherwise would have been difficult, right? Um, that's on, on the discourse side. Now, parking that aside, it is a technical problem. So I think I can go a bit into the technical part. Um, I'll start with the space syntax. I thought that was very interesting and the use of uh, Kangaroo to generate program brief and space syntax is very clever. Um, I will push you to go a bit further. So uh, you are using um, collision between spheres. Now program usually is not equal. It's usually different areas, different volumes. So get a bit into coding and develop custom goals. Like Kangaroo allows you to write your own goals and actually, I think Daniel even has an example of colliding spheres of various sizes. And that will already make your space syntax a bit more interesting because then you can customize it to not be just equal spheres colliding. It could be spheres with different types of program and that's already evolving it. I thought it became a lot more interesting when you went into D. Um, that, that part was a bit more convincing, but even here, the fact that you're using a cell division, um, again, it makes it a bit too equal. And, and the fact that then you're sort of colliding and combining the spaces seems like you're a bit a slave to the algorithm a bit, right? It's because after your cell division, you start to merge them. And it, it could be interesting to also think a bit differently how you could approach it. And I think the path you're taking is right, but develop custom goals I think you have the ability to do it. It looks like you're already scripting, so it's not much more to do to learn how to do it. Um, it was a bit unclear also when you transition from your space syntax to the way you're generating the inner structure. Uh, and I think maybe for that, you could explain a bit more. I understand what you're doing. Like technically I get it. You're using the space and then trying to get the structure below to work. And you're doing this through um, a, a bit of structural analysis. Which, which is a brute force of solving structure from my point of view. And again, I come from a practice where it's all about using less materials. So if you're on, on a setting like the moon, it should be also your main goal. How can I use less materials? Because a lot of your structure is quite brute force solved and it's not quite elegant. It comes a lot more believable when you look at the exterior structure the show like structure, but then you start to be a bit confused. Like, why do I have an inner structure and an outer structure? And why don't they play together? Again, a bit of a missed opportunity. So maybe choose your battle and think, okay, could I have the outer show be the structure and everything inside can be just hanged from that show and come up with a clever solution where you don't use the structure system. I think that that will help you. Now I've made a few more notes on uh, the massing. I actually feel like the mesh wrapping is not the best way to do it. Um, and again, it's mostly because you're looking at 3D printing and other construction techniques. So 3D printers have some limitations on what they can print. Uh, and it's true. Now we can put the extruder to pretty much a robot arm and that sort of solves a bit, let's say the axis problem, but you still have some issues, right? Because when you go out, you have to have some support for the structure as you're building. And again, I'm pretty sure you don't want that. And if you start to drive a bit more these constraints between what can I actually manufacture and how I compute my geometry, you introduce a bit more in the way you're thinking about it. So for example, just think of this, like as I build my shell, the shell wants to be a shell. So then I don't need support for it. And I, I would for sure have some form that is doing less of the cantilevering because otherwise you need support for it as you're printing. 
So that becomes a way to compute better and maybe still a mesh wrapping technique, but maybe you're using something else as your support. In there could be a shell. Uh, now in the documentation, I, I think for this part, I'm for sure not convinced. Like for me, the fact that you are using a lot of non-native Revit elements, and it's not about getting geometry into Revit. Like, I'm sure you, you're going to start working a practice and yes, we can put any geometry into Revit. And actually with Rhino inside, now it becomes even more easy. And with Speckle and uh, there, uh, there's also Beam from Michalis, who's uh, again, doing the job as a one click button and you get your Rhino into Revit, but that doesn't mean you solved it because it has to be native Revit. So the walls should be Revit walls. So then you can use the actual buildup of a wall. And in your cladding, it should be an actual Revit cladding. So then you can change it to something that is Revit, a native Revit. And it's the thing that I would urge you in your next step to do. There are ways to do it. And it's a lot about using the families and for example, putting things into a family and then converting inside the family to a masking and then using that masking to do Revit elements. And so I wouldn't do it manually. I would do it through an automated process, right? Like, okay, I have my shape, it's great. I put it in and I can get my central lines, for example, and then I can turn these into a cladding system and the line becomes a mullion and so on and so forth. And you automate this and you don't do it manually. You can automate it, that's the beauty of it. Uh, it does require a bit of scripting, but I'm sure you can do it. So no, maybe perhaps not. Uh, I mean, this project was tackling without with uh, with some other issues, but you will see that some other other projects are actually uh, pr proposing different strategies to to uh, to accomplish what you uh, discussed, what you described in the end, for sure. Um, but overall, but I, I agree with. Yeah, sorry, I want to say know, that I, I agree with Octavian how especially because they have these frames and it's very very easy. It doesn't really require much scripting, but they can do a parametric model and all those uh, frames can become adaptive components that, that can later change as the design is changing, but it's really native because they just have one mask together and it's really not usable apart for, from just getting the section uh, in the drawing. Yeah, just but quickly. Again, I don't want to take from what you did. It's a really amazing work and um, the fact that you're learning these sort of skills, it's quite something. And Keep, None keep of us it. used Revit before this, so this was like the issue. The, this was the main difficulty in applying this. Uh, no worries, we're, it's we're a we're difficulty like for Revit, the whole uh, architecture users. industry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries. I just, I just quickly to highlight like um, most of the, it's not, it's not most, all of the components in the buildings um, are Revit uh, components. So we made sure like every element, the walls are in Revit uh, components and families. So just wanted like to highlight that. Yeah, wall slabs, um, everything except for the structure and unfortunately the skin. But as you, as you mentioned, like the skin should be made with the adaptive components from Revit. Um, let's let's see um, if Julian has something to add to this. Yeah, I think there was a lot of things said already. I, I'm quite impressed of of all the like the the amount of topics that you had to kind of face in that process. No, like it's it's a lot of like the space syntax and then creating this structural analysis with Caramba plus uh, addressing the fabrication. So, and it's a very linear process and maybe with the, the time you had as, as a, like these three months, I think it was, no, it, it yeah. had to be that if you wanted to address so many things. But what I had the feeling in the end, I, it was the first slide where I got to know a bit the concept of it like when when you show the section no and then there is this like kind of structure around and then you have these inner cubes that work but maybe also caused by the linear process where was the kind of reflecting on what 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 you did no like is it good is it bad like this decision making was a bit missing for me like and a bit of an like i have this option and this option and i choose that option because it does a specific thing or is it more performative in terms of structure or it's like like um 
it like it, it's impressive, but for me, it missed a bit the, the, the process of the of the how you developed this project. Um, also, I can just uh, agree with uh, Tavian about this integration of the different uh, parts. Now you have this Voronoi or, or cell-like structure that is already load bearing. And then you put another structure that is kind of scripted, and then you have another shell on top. And all of them could be load bearing, but you maybe just need one that, that, that supports the structure. <clears throat> Thank you, Julian. Um, sorry, I just I wanted to add quickly to what Julian said, and maybe to wrap up this this uh, group as well. That um, of course the the whole uh, the whole beam, the whole studio was a, as a seven week was a seven week uh, kind of uh, marathon to get to get to the point where they would have enough detail in the project to be able to, to have a challenge to document, no? And to have to, to get to this level of detail is already a challenge itself because it involves all of these processes that they're talking about, the material investigation, the, the form finding technique that they actually, this group in particular, they put a lot of work in the space index aspect uh, because that's where they drive their form, no? And uh, at the end, um, some of, I mean, of course, mo some projects more than others, uh, of course, suffer from the fact that at the end, you you can, you would love to have more time to be able to evaluate these decisions, like you say, and maybe you know come back to another iteration of the whole process to see, to to see how can you come uh, can come up to a to a different result. But you cannot see that actually until to, you get to the end of the of the of the parts now. Oh, sure. And I, I maybe just want to add, I'm, I'm, I'm super impressed by, by what you achieved. And also the, the outcome is, is super nice also, even with the renderings and, and, and things. And, and what I think is, is very um, unique in that uh, studio is also this collaboration and the way of how you include Speckle and the cloud uh, possibilities to kind of communicate and, and at least try to connect them because in the real world this is not happening i would say or not to that extent yet because it's just not possible and that's the nice opportunity you have here and it's quite impressive to see that working absolutely yeah i mean this is even a challenge even in a small research project like this one it's been a challenge not only within the group within the the community but in within the groups themselves because it's all of the students are are not working together in the same room. They actually have to intercommunicate within themselves. No, so uh, yeah. thanks. Um, yeah, I just I just wanted to add that I, I think this uh, all all the comments were uh, very interesting food for thought, and I'm sure that uh, the the students who develop this project will take this into consideration. Of course, for uh, whether they want to follow to further this project or for their future projects. Um, I also wanted to say that given the short time of the of the studio, I think it's something that we will see in most of the projects that uh, the the group kind of decided to focus on one aspect or the other or, or a different aspect of um, of what would be a complete, uh, very well developed, very realistic project. And in this case, I think um, it's a very interesting. Um, workflow, although linear, as uh, Julian was saying, it's a very interesting workflow to generate this um, our, this planning automatically um, with a non-standard non -sta standard planning method. So I want to commend you guys for this, that you actually got it all the way through to the end. Definitely. Um, just a quick reminder for the juries that there's a link to the documentation on the on chat that you can review so that there's kind of like another um, in the in there you can see more in detail like um, um, you know the the revit documentation that they managed to run from this kind of more complex project in, and you can actually see a little bit of the struggles and the pain of bringing this project into into there probably uh, but in any case uh, i think it's we need to, oh, Alexander just posted also the little, the configurator of the space syntax that they've built in the web. And these are all subjects that we cannot actually have spend too much time uh, 
you know, discussing here because of the uh, of mainly the fact that we have just a few a little time to discuss all of the projects and we have to be fair to everyone. But feel free to play around with the configurator and look at the plans because I think they really show a lot of the struggles and the efforts that they put on the site for these projects. And I want to applaud this group as well for their for their kind of global effort in bringing this project into something really coherent. So thanks. Thank, um, you. Thank you for the criticism and uh, all the recommendations. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, so let's let's quickly jump to the next project so that uh, so that we don't lose the flow of the of the conversation. Uh, this is the sports center, as far as I know. Yeah. Okay. So you guys are ready. Please start by introducing yourselves, and then and then yeah. that'll roll. Yeah, sure. So yeah. So um, we are group four. Uh, so it's uh, me, Keshava, Felipe, and uh, Basel. And our project is titled the Sports Centrifuge. So we have divided the project like the presentation to three parts, which is the design vision, the design development, and the BIM workflow. So in order to understand the sports complex on the moon, we had to uh, define, like we had to understand how do people live in the moon. So, and you may ask us why centrifuge. So in order to understand that, we um, we kind of understood the, the effects of uh, weightlessness on the human body in the moon. Uh, so there are uh, two aspects to it. One, one is the short-term benefits due to weightlessness and there's long-term constraints. So the, <clears throat> the short-term benefits are that uh, the body feels uh, rejuvenated due to reduced stress on the bones and muscles due to almost zero gravity. And the muscles loosen up and there's reduced space, uh, stress on the spinal cord. And there's also a temporary increase in height. Uh, so the long-term constraints are that the muscle mass tends to weaken when you're, uh, when you're, uh, when you're for a longer period of time on the moon. Uh, and also, uh, this also results in fatigue, uh, due, <clears throat> fatigue, and uh, the heart also produces lesser blood due to lesser resistance against gravity. So, <clears throat> so we then we started to see on how the how to generate artificial gravity. Then we on research we understood that artificial gravity can be generated by means of a centrifuge and is integral for a long term stay on the moon. Uh, several uh, proposals for space, space stations uh, by NASA have, all, uh, have always contained the centrifuge uh, in order to suffice the human race over a long period of time in space. So this leads to a design concept. So we decided to embrace the, the fact that we, can, uh, that we can generate two types of environments in our, uh, in our, uh, in our project which is uh, embracing the moon's gravity to enjoy the weightlessness in the short term, and also use the centrifuge to generate Earth's gravity, which can also help in retaining the muscle structure and the well wellness of the human body in the longer term for the, uh, for the inhabitants of the moon. So, which also leads us to the program. So, the program of the sports complex on the moon will be mostly similar to the sports complex on Earth, but it's just that we are going to add another uh, centrifuge or gravity zone so so in this we can also uh, like we've also classified the program according to programs that need gravity and the programs that do not need gravity and also there are some programs like the sports sports fields and the gym that may need both so okay so and uh, so so we started looking at uh, the whole uh, distribution of uses and then we saw we started placing them in their appropriate spots in the in, in when it comes to a moon complex so we realized that we would have uh, spaces that would be enclosed by the centrifuge and spaces that would uh, float above it and spaces would, that would go below it and you can go to the next slide please and so uh, when we started thinking about the centrifuge, we started uh, looking at how we could achieve the required gravity of, of the Earth by min uh, by while minimizing the uh, the speed of rotation and the size of the of the uh, torus. Next slide, please. And so uh, we imagined it as a line, as a linear di distribution that would uh, revolve around itself, and then we'd start uh, distributing the program. Next slide. Yeah, and then. Uh, we started adding uh, a, a space uh, that would protrude uh, at the top of the of the program, so that that would have the house our stadium, and it would house the uh, it would allow us for for visual connection with other projects. And then we would add an underground uh, uh, area for the u for the uh, utilities and for the access. Okay, next slide, please. 
Yes, and then we started developing the form a bit more, and so we started using a, a framed structure to uh, a, a structure of frames that are made from uh, co uh, lunar concrete, so that uh, they would hold the project together. Yeah, and uh, we had our slabs made of uh, solar sintered uh, regolith. Yeah. And we had our axis from the bottom right, as you can see. And we started adding uh, ribs that would connect the rib. Uh, we started adding uh, ties that would connect the ribs and would connect the slabs as well as we hold them in place. Yes. And then we added our uh, we added our stadium at the top uh, for multi for uh, several uses, right? And we started adding uh, sev several plates that are supported by a tree structure. So that uh, we thought maybe uh, a part of activity is that people would actually start uh, jumping between platforms instead of just walking because or just climbing steps because of the gravity of the moon that allows them to just have a step that's similar to a jump. Yeah, in the next slide, please. And then we added uh, two... Uh, uh, we added two ramps that would actually flow through the entire project connecting the different levels. Yes. Yeah. And this is just a zoomed in view of that. Yeah. Slide. Yeah, and then we start we then added the the tourist that's the, in the center of the, all of that. And then we started adding our panels and we can see that the panels um next slide. We can see that the panels uh, are actually getting uh, enclosed because the large part of the uh, large portion of the project is underground. And then the closer you get to the stadium the more open it is because uh, we believe that that's in in the moon people could actually watch uh, f f the matches just by j jumping on top of the project and just watching it from the top. Okay, the next uh, slide. Yeah, and this is just a simple uh, uh, simple diagram showing what we uh, imagined. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so for the design development, we start looking at the different uh, program distribution, and we did all the documentation in Revit, and we will explain further um, all the workflow that we did. But in essence, we start looking at the different top like level, uh, which is our main stadium. We provide us with a different sort of like sport uh, courts and facilities for recreation and uses. And as Basel already mentioned, so the, the location of the stadium is in relationship to the, the whole context of the, of the moon settlement. And in the next slide, you will see something that we, we call it as the Taurus level, which is for us like the main, let's say like the heart of the, of the program, of the building, sorry. So we provide like a series of different uses uh, in relationship to the Taurus, which we'll explain later as well. And some of like, different uses that are related to say uh, tennis courts and running tracks. So in the next slide, you will see the bottom level, which is the one that we are using right now to provide access to a torus, which is made by different sort of like pots that are getting inside the torus. And of course it's complemented with a series of facilities. And then for the lower level, we have the main access to the project, but as well the connection to LNS, which is what David already explained so in terms of the sections, we start looking at the four different elements. So we have all the regular panels that are the, the facade for the, the project. We also have the spinning turrets, which is also moving, um, is still rotating in the inside. And we have the connected structure, which is an integrated structure between the envelope and the, and the torus, as well as the, yeah, the rib structure. So we start looking at then the different uh, definition of the materials. So we have uh, 3D printing regolith carbon fiber composite for the rib structure, as well as panel made from sinter and regolith with a combination of glass panels that are made from basalt in the regolith. Which is also explained a little bit further in the next slide, which is more like an exploded axo. And so, in the next one, we then start looking at the different modularity for the interiors of the project. So we kind of like get a that idea of having like a series of spaces that allow us to have like a, you know, like like flexibility in between the different uses. So we have the first module, which is the a module that gave us a big waiting area or like an indoor area that can provide us with toilets as well and, and say like indoor sports facilities. Then the second module gave us three different uh, small segments, which is provided with uh, facilities in the middle and then sort of like different uses in the, on, the, on both sides. And the third one is the larger uh, module that gave us more like the opportunity to integrate the outside spaces to, to these modules. 
And then as you can see in the next image, it's just, this is a look and feel of, of all the rampings and the platforms inside the project. So then we define the concept for the main tour. So we are looking at four different design objectives. So we have the outside segment for the torus, considering that gravity is pushing everything to the outside of the, of the torus. We have the main stripe, which is at the moment we are using as a Mobius concept to develop that idea. And then we have the internal segment, which is uh, going against gravity. And of course, we start thinking now what's the distribution of the program inside the torus. Uh, we develop like three different uh, form generation process inside the torus. So we, for the outside, we start looking at Bevin's noise, like different type of noise that gave us, uh, that could inform the, the design decisions inside, inside the torus. Then for the main strap, we decided to go for a neutral pro, uh, surface. And the internal one is using a sphere sequence noise, which allow us to have more like a smooth area. And then we also start looking the, we start using void agencies to understand what's the implication of the movement inside the torus and how that will affect the, the spinning and the uses inside. And then as you can see in the next one, we kind of like uh, exploded the whole thing and we have like, all the difference outside, like the segments, we provide like a series of illuminated rings inside the torus that is complemented with a series of, um, let's say like climbing paths or climbing areas for the, the, the zones that are going against gravity. We also have the running paths as well as the reef structure and the internal segments. Basel. Maybe go to the next one, Keshav. Yeah, I'm me. sorry, I'm sorry, I'm muted. I, was, I was muted, sorry. Uh, yeah, so so uh, when we started thinking about how the, the, the tours would actually work, uh, we decided to have a, a body that would hold, uh, hold it as a frame and then have an electromagnet on the outside that uh, would actually propel a uh, superconductor, a high temperature superconductor that is uh, that that reaches its, reaches its, its temperature using a liquid coolant, and this would allow it to, to actually propel using uh, quantum lock. Yeah, and uh, the interior, and we we decided to use a carbon fiber regolith as well for the torus, which is similar to the one being used in Hyperloop, just lunar one. Yeah, next slide. And this uh, is an example. Um, of actually uh, a prototype that's actually working. And this is using a high temperature superconductor. And actually right now, uh, there is a re research paper that was just published recently that you could actually f use uh, a room temperature superconductor. So you don't need liquid cooling, you don't need liquid nit nitrogen. Yeah, next uh, next slide. Yeah, so then uh, we kind of uh, were thinking about how to really uh, vimify the design to say, and also how to optimize these kind of various design decisions that are coming across in this uh, in this project. So in the initial collaborative workflow, so we took uh, Maya and Rhino as our initial form generating uh, software, which was then of course taken to Rhino and Grasshopper to refine the form and to also parameterize the form, which was uh, then uh, the three of us, we kind of spent our uh, streams in Speckle and, uh, and we kind of combined them in Rhino Insight and then uh, use Revit for documenting and detailing the project. So um, then we, uh, we took a step back and, to, uh, and we decided to kind of parameterize the whole model. So then we, uh, we kind of decided on what are the parameters in which the design can change or what, on what parameters we can make the whole project parametric. So the first parameter is the radius of the torus, of course. And the second, uh, second is kind of the sections of the building. Which can which can go up and down and can adjust with respect to the terrain or the topography of the site so that it can place itself accordingly. And the last one is the number of ribs in the overall building that can uh, that can also be possibly informed by the structural analysis. So sorry, Kishal, I think I think we need to go a little bit faster because yeah, we're yeah. running out of time. Yeah, yeah. So then uh, the final. So then we made a, a, a code that can uh, self-orient and adjust itself with respect to the terrain. So that let's say if the client moves the model across the terrain, so the, the project kind of orients itself accordingly. And uh, yeah, with respect to the dynamic parameters. And then we use the uh, Rhino and set Revit to kind of split it into flows parametrically and send it to each other for working. Uh, then we used uh, K-means optimization to kind of, uh, and Kangaroo to kind of uh, group these uh, panels together 
uh, in terms of similar size and kind of optimize the panels uh, to a same size which can be constructed and then uh, we took uh, we took the adaptive competence approach to kind of uh, refine the, the building for towards construction so there are five types of panels so there are uh, so i mean five types of uh, adaptive components um, that we're using one uh, yeah yeah you can go ahead yeah, so we have like different type of families that if you go to the next slide, so we start using scheduling just to consider the amount of, let's say, units of panels inside the project. So we have like three, like one panel that is fully closed, which is the one that goes underground. So the next one is a panel that is a triangular panel with that provide us with a different sort of like offset. If you go to the next slide different type of offset and we also quantify them in a different way uh, and then we analyze them the same for the dome uh, which provide us it's a panel that is provided with with a different uh, type of opening and we did the same for for the the rest of the building for the platforms we also have like this uh, as a, an adaptive component and we kind of like have those those quantities and maybe just go to Keep going because we run out of time. So this is just uh, some of the screenshots of the whole auto workflow and the initial. Yep, keep going and then some yeah, of the so renders. Yep. Yeah. So these are just some of the renders. I think that's that's it, David. Thank you. Uh, thank you, guys. I'm sorry you had to run at the end, uh, but uh, in any case, I think we didn't really miss that much. Uh, and it's a nice set of final images that you produced in these two weeks. So I, I, I congratulate you. Um, I think we're going to just jump straight to the to the juries. Maybe this time, uh, Jules, you want, uh, Julian, you want to start? Yeah, I can, can start then. I was quite impressed by the by the by the beginning and and all this uh, century. Google uh, like kind of concept. It's it's very interesting. Uh, maybe I have to learn a bit more about this. It's it's actually creating gravity in the in the space yes. now, and yeah. so that people yeah. can basically work out with a uh, bit more of gravity than you have in yes. in the moon. Okay, mm -hmm. and then also the platform situation and the slides and and these ramps. It's it's kind of a, a, a cool playful combination, I think. Um, I, I, I would, I would um, jump maybe more towards the end and the technical part because I think the adaptive component creation was quite an interesting thing. And I would like to ask you, um, how did you actually transfer the geometry from your Rhino design to Revit? What, what, was, the, what was the method here? Like, uh, it was using, uh, maybe if I can skip past a few slides. So uh, it was using Rhino inside Revit. So we kind of did the panelization process like using uh, K-Bins clustering in Grasshopper. And then we got it into, uh, like then we got the list of points and then we modeled the adaptive component in Revit. And then we used uh, uh, the adaptive components by points component in, uh, in Rhino inside Revit to kind of uh, map the adaptive components into the thing. Okay, so you, you, you basically had a direct connection from yes. your uh, Rhino to Revit via Rhino yes. inside. Did you, yes. did you investigate also options to like transfer that via Speckle or another like kind of web-based? Uh, yeah, we, we use a Speckle as our main, as our main yeah, platform to, to transfer data between us. Yeah, did I think you, we kind so of when, like- when, when it, yeah, go on, sorry. You know, like yeah. the, the, the idea that I'm following or that comes up often is like, how do you kind of transfer these, uh, this geometry through the web to the other software? So yeah. Rhino Inside mm -hmm. is a direct connection. Now that gives yeah. you four points, but why don't you transfer these four points on, uh, on yeah. the cloud, basically? I mean, yeah, that's what we did. We kind of took the four points in the cloud, but we had to use Rhino inside to have this adaptive okay. components uh, by points component yeah. that comes only in Rhino inside Revit. And then we kind of mapped all the uh, like all the geometry in our building, like the columns, the the, the floors, the uh, and the and the and the panels, of course. 
using Rhino inside Revit, and we brought everything into Revit as a nat Revit native geometry. Mm -hmm. So I'll kind of like I'll kind of take you through the collaborative workflow that we've planned. So it's, so like we're just kind of assuming that like there are three architects. So one architect kind of designs these adaptive components that we showed you earlier, the the columns and the and the facade structure and the panels. And uh, let's say the client kind of decides the location of the project. So the second row architect kind of takes the role of a compiler who just takes these adaptive components and takes the takes the lo location uh, of the uh, of the site from like the client says speckle and kind of compiles this information using speckle and Rhino inside uh, Revit to kind of generate this uh, dynamic BIM building, which can be like which can again be used by the third architect to generate drawings. Like so, this was the kind of collaborative workflow that we had. Adopted in the project. Cool. It's really, yeah. it's really convincing, I think. Uh, Julian, one question for you. Mm. What would be the benefit of, of bringing those points to the cloud and then back to Revit instead of directly bringing them to Revit? Is it this just for the sole purpose of intercollaboration of the project? or? Yes, I would say so, because you don't need the, the two you know, software environments in the same place, let's say. Okay. No, you can have one person working on the Revit side and the other one on the Rhino and you have this collaborative like kind of container that not only has only the points, but also has like other kind of elements that, that you can kind of pick from there and you use it for your purpose. Sure. And it's not like a one man show. It's like a team, no? a, 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 a team that can be wherever. Sure, sure, sure. And, and that's kind of like a very big advantage, yeah. I think. Maybe maybe a last question from my side. The the form finding for the shape was was influenced. The parameters for that was was only the the landscape or how did the, these iterations were kind of influenced of the of these like circular structure. So I think that the form finding was like pretty much uh, dictating by the the idea of having the main torus in the center. And that led, led us to, to, you know, to have that main ring. And then we just start looking at how, if we need to add more program, how are we going to add it and where are we going to put it now? So is, if it's going to be up or down or it's going to be on the side. Yeah, uh, that is kind of decided by the terrain. Like okay. the terrain and order. program, let's say. Yeah. 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 And, and the essentiality of having the uh, the torus being uh, completely level. So that's why it would actually sometimes go underground because it cannot uh, rotate to, to, because it, then the forces of gravity would be distributed and then yeah. people will not actually be able to do what, what they're supposed to do. That's a good point. So the, the gravity yeah. is also kind of playing yeah. a part into the form. Yes. Thing. That's what yeah. I want to know. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Really nice. Um, thanks, uh, Octavian. Or, yeah. I, I want to say I'm really impressed by your work, and, um, especially in the form finding. Uh, it's very elegant. And I I kind of saw so you kind of went a bit because you were looking at so the form also expressed with mathematical function. Yeah. And uh, I think from my point of view, it's very convincing because it's also driving quite well the thinking on your concept. So I, I love it, yeah. it's very well done. Now on um, your shelf, on your cladding, mm -hmm. I think you could improve a bit. So mm -hmm. you're now opening based on program, right? So your yeah. shelf is opening wherever the program is. And I wonder if yeah. you would maybe shift the program to also look at sun axis, in your case, radiation. Mm -hmm. So you don't end up opening your facade where you have direct sun or something that will actually make it not very clever. and that would be an extra step that I think will make it even more convincing. Yeah. Um, I was sort of smiling because your workflow is exactly the workflow we do professionally. And yeah. uh, actually one of the projects where I first um, used this workflow was a stadium for the next walk up. And I had fun enough, it's the same geometry, triangles, diamonds, and it's exactly what we did. And I agree with uh, Julian. Uh, sending your points um, and having something that can pick them up you not know, having the two environments live is exactly what we did we end up yeah. making an internal server in-house okay. uh, that was hosting the points uh, exactly for this because we had people who were working on the rhino side 
-hmm. And then we have a different set of people implementing into Revit. We're using exactly adaptive components. So that, that was quite good. Um, I don't know where you go forward from here because it seems you're in a very good spot. Very okay, that <laughs> lots of things done. So I wonder if next thing you challenge yourself to maybe also look at other collaborative workflows because I yeah. don't think it's all about getting geometry into Revit. It's also um, using some other things. So for example, I don't know if you're looking to Team 360 and start mm -hmm. to use, uh, let's call the Revit workflows of work sets and having uh, different packages. So I don't know if you want to go into that direction. So I would so love to see the documentation yeah. as a proper I, Revit yeah, sheet I... and then you start to put together different packages. I don't know. I don't know exactly where you want to go with it, but um, think also about this because it looks like you solved quite a few things. So um, push yourself to, I don't know, if I would be you, I would say, mm, let's start to document it, but you know, Revit fashion, like start to have a sheet file, you have your model file, and I don't know, you make packages sort of like here is my structural package. Here is my cladding course. I think there's a lot of layers that, that you can add to this, and and also in the terms of inter collaboration, and because I mean Revit is one side, but if you would start to add engineering uh, constraints, that's first, more than Not even considering the, the just the structural engineering or or you know MEP or this kind, of, but but also the, the the space layer that comes into all of these projects would have to be another layer that we're probably not as used to tackling as architects you know, because there's a lot of engineering space engineering considerations that that we're probably just uh, sliding by here in, in our comments but uh yeah indeed um Srinka, i don't know if you want to add something to this as well yeah i think it's amazing really i love the project uh, you put a lot of work into it and for me like design wise it looks great interiors also and the uh, most impressive part was the fact that you really managed to look into adaptive components and create all these different kinds and transform the data to me i mean this is something that we do in the office and i absolutely love it so congrats um i wanted to ask you about the and also actually i noticed in this project that the process was not quite linear so I think in these two months, you really managed because you you had your form and the program, but then you kind of managed to go back and yeah. reevaluate your design. I think it's really, really uh, great that in this short time, you managed to, to, to like not have a linear process. Yeah. I was wondering about, uh, did, like in general, did you have a look at the load of the structure and I'm, I'm not sure how it works in space, but in the Earth, we no. have the dead load, the live load, and the momentum. Yeah. So I don't know if this is something that you can maybe look at uh, yeah. like a next the, step. I mean, uh, I mean yeah. Also, sorry? Yeah, I mean, if we had three more days time, we could have done that, but yeah, <laughs> that was the next yeah. step. Yeah, <laughs> but it would be nice to like think of what are these loads in, in yeah. Moon and uh, and then also as David was saying, there are a lot of other disciplines like we have. So yeah. all of this is kind of connected. Uh, the thing about when you said that the structure is dynamic, I understand that force is spinning, but at some point there was a video where you showed the structure actually moving around the site. Are you proposing that it will be movable or no? No, no, no. I'm just saying yeah. that those are alterable parameters. Like I'm not saying it's dynamic in the building. Like I'm just saying, yeah. So okay. if I can add, like I think at the beginning we we had, you know, because we had that idea of interconnecting all the projects in the moon, mm -hmm. on the moon. Sorry. So we some of the parameters were that we should be next to some of our neighbors that we pick at the beginning. So what happened is like we start looking that the terrain of course changes all the time and every time the form was adapting we we thought like how we can make the form to adapt like to those new locations you know mm -hmm. and then like that we end up with the, with a final say a definition where is was the preferred location of yeah, the project okay good 
Um, thanks. Uh, I, I want to add something, and I think it's, it was at one point uh, the guys, these guys, kind of stopped the press and reper you know they they I took the time to reparameterize the whole project just for this mm -hmm. purpose, you know, for the purpose of yeah. of optimization and also. Uh, making the project a bit more responsive to the to the requirements and the context, and also the performance that they, they that they choose because they had these constraints of being kind of uh, symmetrical in two planes because of the gravity um, mechanism that they're making. And I think uh, even though this took a lot of effort, it really paid off now in the end, right, guys? To yeah, to, yeah. to parameterize the project and and yeah. And that would act, that would also allow uh, kind of allow you to measure the different iterations that it was that yes. the project took. Um, so in a way, this project is a bit more not so linear. So it took kind of a, a circular approach, and they run to many iterations, as you can see there, to to come to this point. Um, in any case, I think uh, I can also I also want to congratulate you for the for, congratulate you for the big push that you made in these two weeks that we haven't seen each other because. I think you managed to to uh, successfully fill fill in a lot of the gaps that were missing in the project. So thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, thank, um, you. thank you. Um, I think we we can just move to the next project if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So thanks, guys. Good job. And um, uh, let's let's uh, go to the next one. Which is group six. By the way, Kiki, if you're about, if you're in there in the uh, somewhere, if you wanna say something just feel free to raise your hand or or as you as you please fine yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay there's a right right now inside there being mentioned every now, every now and then and uh, especially well st stuff that might tie up to the to the challenges that you are so face in bringing uh, i don't know a special type of bespoke components to the project sometimes maybe um Okay, let's um, let's go for the next one. No, uh, now we have the botanical garden. Am I, am I correct? Yep. This is a rather ambitious undertaking of bringing uh, some of the other inhabitants of our planets to the moon as well. Um, Amar, Polina. Polina, are you sharing? As you. Uh, oh no, I thought you would be sharing. You have a go from mission control. I can share. <laughs> Just give me one second. Yep. Good day, everyone. This is Group Six, uh, Polina, Sachin, and myself, Amma, and we'll be taking you through a project, Noah's Botanical Garden and Wildlife Reserve. Polina and myself are based in Melbourne, and Sachin is in New Delhi. Uh, this will be the sequence of our presentation today. Firstly, talking about a vision, then the research, introduction, concept, a user experience, animation, program areas, the different components of the project construction technique, and the computation process. Our intent is to create a natural habitat for a number of species, both from the plant and animal world. The aim is to have an array of spaces with varying degrees of volume, gravitational force, temperature, and natural light. This will give the plants and animals the opportunity to gradually adapt to the moon's environment. Over time, we want them to be in harmony with the new environment and create a unique ecosystem where they can thrive. Our approach for this project lies in between two conflicting worlds, between the earth and the moon, between humans and animals, technical and conceptual, in between the rigid and free form. Our intent is not to merge these worlds perfectly together, but rather to create a dialogue between them from which a new idea, from which new ideas and new worlds would emerge. We started by investigating the different conditions on the moon and earth. For this project, we'll be focusing on gravity and temperature. 
Earth has a gravitational force of 9.8 meters per second square, whereas the moon has only 1.62 meters per second square. The Earth has a maximum temperature of 58 degrees Celsius and a minimum of negative 88, whereas the moon's temperature ranges from 127 degrees to minus 173 degrees Celsius. This matrix diagram illustrates the composition of the varying, varying degrees of temperature and gravity. Gravity is placed on the top-down axis where the Earth conditions are at the bottom and the moon conditions on top. Temperature is organized on the right-left axis where the two extreme hot and cold temperatures are placed on either side of the Earth, like temperature chambers are placed in the middle. All of the chambers lead to an outer volume that has all of the moon conditions. Seeds and embryos brought from the Earth will be incubated in the lower chambers. Once ready, they will be gradually moved up towards the moon condition chambers, and finally to the outer volume that will be the main garden and reserve. In essence, our project has two parts to it. The inner core that houses the adaptation chambers, the infrastructure, services, and the visitor areas, and the outer volume that contains the animal reserve and botanical garden. Our research into construction materials and techniques led us to the extensive use of lunar regolith in various forms. Lunar regolith has various other minerals that can be extracted and processed into other construction materials. For example, silicon and aluminum can be used to make glass, iron and aluminum into structural elements. The lunar regolith can also be mixed with a binder to create lunar crit that can be made into blocks deposited by robotic ants or as a material for 3D printing. The growth and development of the plants and animals start with the transportation of the seeds and embryos to the moon. Once on the moon, the first step is, to is the incubation of single cell organisms, followed by plants, then to small organisms and insects, slowly moving on to smaller plants and birds. Once adapted, the animals are then released into uh, the wildlife reserve. The initial selection of species are based on plants and animals that, put up, that are present at the lower level of the food chain. This will allow them to build a balanced ecosystem over time, gently moving up the food chain. This diagram here shows an overview of um, the various components that make up our project. The first three layers, the infrastructure, the visitor area, and the glass envelope make up the inner core. And the second set of layers, the regular platforms, circulation, and regular shell form the outer volume. This sort of illustrates the area breakdown of the programs, areas for humans on the left and areas for the animals um, on the right hand side. And based on the colony, uh, we are located on the southern end of the colony with the lunar residence and the space farm as our neighbors. I will quickly run through this animation here. Yeah, so in our project, uh, the visitor's experience was highly considered. Um, for this reason, before we continue with the design discourse, we wanted to show um, this walkthrough, which is basically what we, we wanted to give in terms of experience to the users. Um, the idea is that the people from the colony will be visiting this space uh, continuously, not just once, and it needs to give that sort of abundance and diversity in terms of spaces, in terms of various animals, various plants and so on. So people would like to go back there. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please. So this is one side of the um, user experience in the whole building, which is in the regular part. And uh, here is the other part, which is the uh, glass core, where we'll have this um, spinning spheres and um, various chambers um, and this also creates some sort of a museum gallery experience for the for the user that will be moving with elevators um, up and down and uh, the spheres will be spinning around um, around the visitors next slide please Um, so here we can see the gradual decrease of size of uh, the moderate temperature chamber as it goes to the next levels. Uh, the whole concept behind this is that um, as we go up in height, we are getting closer to the moon conditions. So the, um, the very hot and very cold chambers become bigger and the moderate temperature chambers be become smaller. 
Um, the visitors, on the other hand, will be experiencing these spinning chambers in a sort of a gallery glass core. The spaces allocated for the vi visitors include museum, lounge, library, cafe, private areas, infrastructure, research lab services, and as well as um, other mechanics and um, people that we will be looking after this place. To be able to preserve the temperature conditions in the infrastructure and also around the spheres, uh, we had to encapsulate this whole volume. Uh, so we have done that with this sort of uh, aluminum frames and uh, glass envelope. Um, this is an example from Revit, just one of the chambers that's been documented. We documented the whole infrastructure and actually the whole project in uh, Revit. Um, yeah, and you can see that as a separate uh, separate file in our folder. This is a very simple explanation on how the chambers work or the principle where we have an external um, external membrane where the rotors are, then internal rotating cylinder with the relief, um, the plants as well as the animals. So the animals will be going will be attached to the surface. And with various speeds, we can achieve various um, degree of, of gravity. The same is the case. This is just a different type of chamber for the cold uh, temperature, where we'll have also water, uh, just explaining external envelope then internal um, rotating sphere with uh, water, then the spaces for the visitors and the infrastructure. Next slide, please. Um, here you can see um, a sneak peek from our um, areas, plans and schedules. So in our computational or like kind of workflow between Revit and Rhino Insight, uh, we used um, these rooms a lot because basically uh, Rhino Insight geometry was picking up on the centers of those rooms and um, um, the infrastructure rooms were informing where the chambers should be in, in the project. So in that sense, we've created an interlinked process between um, Grasshopper and Revit. So coming to the animal reserve, uh, we looked into various natural habitats on the earth as an inspiration and went on to create diverse spaces that would allow such habitats to develop over the time. Our intention for the outer regolith volume was to create a range of spaces and habitats uh, for the animals to live in. With this in mind, four distinct zones were created, a forest, grasslands, wetlands, and the tundra area. Spatial needs for these habitats, together with the need for the light in the inner glass core, inform the volume of the outer regular shell. Uh, the outer volume is made up of four parts. Firstly, the circulation path and the tube. Uh, which the visitors will use to experience the wildlife reserve. Second, the inner regolith with ramps for animals to access various parts of the reserve. Third, the supporting grid shell structure. And lastly, the regolith skin. We used Colibra to integrate the swarm behavior in the workflow and create the regolith form. So this section shows the parts in the relation between the inner core, which is a more structured element of the design and the outer regolith volume. In more detail, the outer regular shell is composed of the following layers, an inner wire mesh to hold the regular deposits, an aluminum frame system that are joined by 3D printed nodes, the regular deposits followed by the aluminum frames and the glass panels. The topography of the space is vital for the habitat. The diagram on the left shows the created topography of the landscape using multi-behaviors in Culebra. And the diagram on the right shows the primary migration path of the animals around the reserve uh, based on the different ecological zones and water bodies. The water body is intentionally placed in three corners to allow migration of animals in a loop. Although these spaces would be of adaptive nature, we believe by creating different habitat areas based on the topology and ecology will be essential for survival of the animals. The trees and the plants are chosen based on the resilient nature. In other words, low sensitivity to changes, high capacity to adapt to the environment and the capacity to provide food for the animals of the reserve. These trees and plants are then allocated based on the different types of ecological zones created. 
In order to access these habitat areas, humans use the circulation tubes for transportation. The circulation glass tube is a space frame supported structure uh, rested on regolith columns that lead to ramps and platforms for interacting with the animals. Here is a render overlooking at the forest area from the platforms. Overall, the size of the building is based on the function and the animal habitat spaces needed to create the ecology and the desired human animal interaction for the colony on the moon. Coming to the construction timeline, the diagram shows the schematic overview of the project divided into three main phases, namely infrastructure tubes, ecological chambers, and the regular structure. From our research, we propose to include swarm intelligence in creating the regular structure. Swarm intelligence using self-organizing robots include collective swarm uh, random behavior. These robots have ability to dig and load regolith uh, and can be programmed to create any form. The construction would include five master robots with the ability to control 50 mini robots each. The master robots will be used for transporting heavy elements heavy equipments for the colony as well. These would, in, these would be controlled by humans in the service station. The mini robots will be equipped with loading arm and Zion lights radiator for sticking the regular layer over the grid shell structure using the centration method. The stages of construction include excavation using robots, creating the infrastructure for the core using 3D printing, robotic assembly of prefab elements for chambers and outer shell, and then covering the whole structure by robotic ants using uh, using robotic ants, uh, using swarm behavior. The exact volume of the excavated regolith will be used to form the outer regolith structure, making it an efficient use of the resources. I'm not sure if we have more time, but uh, yeah, we used uh, extensively Revit um, for documentation and part of the whole project is designed in Revit and um, the more organic part is done in Rhino and Grasshopper, and it was all synced uh, via Speckle. And on the next slide, you can see in more detail how exactly the, the different files were working. Um, but I, I think I think we've run out of time already. Thank you. At least uh, walk us through these images, Paulina, if you want. Okay. You want. Yeah, sure. This is the forest area. Um, this is the wetland area where we have nice, um, also created um, possibility for the visitors to, to go in the river and, and in the various dams. Um, we've got all those platforms that remind very much on Rio Reserve. Um, yes, some animals here and the wetland chamber, uh, wetland regulate area. And again, we have very nice waterfalls falling from the top of the um, metabol volume to the bottom. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, this is certainly like a big, uh, big scoped and challenging project uh, undertaking that you took uh, for sure. Um, I before we go to the to the comments of the jurors. So I would like to welcome and introduce uh, Xavier, who just joined us. Everyone, uh, I'm a bit late. No worries. Thanks a lot for thanks a lot for stepping in. Um, uh, you, you, we still have a, a couple, a few projects that you hopefully you're gonna join and join seeing. And yeah, definitely. Um, in any case, um, who wants to take this one a crack? I don't know if Octavian wanna start it on, on this one. Or maybe Srinka, whoever. I, I can go ahead. I think you you managed to cover quite a bit of uh, ground, and um, I appreciated how you're using circulation as a way to drive the geometry computation. It would have been a bit easier to understand also if you know, your geometry computation is also constrained somehow by the fabrication technique. Um, you're, you're referencing some of those robots that 3D print. And I wonder if you look at what I was describing for the first project, the constraints of 3D printing, there are certain shapes that you can 3D print without structure support. And there are some that you cannot. Um, and it would be good to actually inform your geometry computation by those constraints as well. 
overall, um, I think you did a well structure presentation and it's clear, but um, maybe just looking at the focus of the program, which is quite a more technical approach, I would have appreciated to see a further slide on how you use the transition from Rhino Grasshopper to Revit and how is that actually enabled by the skills you're learning. So maybe for that part, spend a bit more time in the future, especially because it's the focus of the program. Otherwise, I, I would have said a bit of a, just a workflow explanation would be enough. Um, but well, well done, yeah. Yep, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Um, Srinka, you wanna jump in? Yeah, I can jump in. Uh, I think it's a very ambitious project. Uh, the topic is very nice, but it's quite ambitious to build this on the moon, I guess. Uh, I, I think you did a lot of research and designed these chambers, hot and cold, and they, to me, they looked quite convincing your whole infrastructure but i'm not quite sure about the about the skin and to me it looks a bit too heavy for a botanical garden i don't know if you could maybe look at alternative options for to encapsulate these chambers or i, I don't really understand from the presentation where is this form coming from because the chambers seem to be very elaborate but the actual skin uh I didn't really, I didn't really understand how how it came from. And then I was also thinking, because you have so much, so many things and different species, maybe you can also look at uh, like a part of your building that has like a facility for food production. Maybe it could be interesting uh, to incorporate this as well in the. The building because I don't think we've seen at least in the presentation before that there was such facilities or so maybe could be in incorporated in this. Yeah. But the presentation was well structured, I think, and uh, yeah, it was nice. I liked it. Thanks. Um, Thank you. You guys want to comment or may maybe I can comment a bit a little bit on the. Yeah. Of course, on the struggles of, of bringing this to fabrication, this project was somehow also uh, has always has always been like a duality between the the um, rather complex mechanism that they pro proposed in the insights of the project to you know make the the environment for the for the animals work, and also this organic uh, rather organic kind of more bottom up skin that they propose. Mm. And um, yeah, I think it's also um, a project that has also dived in so deep into the research of of making things work for the animals. And in a way, we had to also took a lot of uh, you know decisions, quick decisions on how to make this uh, structure work in the end. No, but as, as as usual, what is probably common to all of the projects is that there are so many interesting loose aspects that one can follow to to to. You know, to dive in deeper to make them uh, be more feasible, or, or at least that you can actually at some points you got, you actually hit a dead end and have to come back to to uh, you know rethink the whole project. But the final push was, of course, to to get this to a level where where it can be properly documented, and you can get a hint of that by seeing at the at the at the documents that they posted as well. So. Uh, Yules, I don't know if you want to add also, to that. Also, maybe the, I mean, what I want to mention is maybe that the topic is a quite challenging one, no? Like, because it wants to bring life to the moon somehow. Mm -hmm. And and this is kind of the essential the thing or the challenge that, that everybody's thinking about. And for that, maybe it also became a bit this uh, kind of technical part that is that that looks to me very technical I, I somehow like the sketch more than the actual 3d model that looks a bit like um rigid and of course it's technical but um the integration into the shape and then what is on top of it um is missing a bit of kind of a connection somehow uh, also the structure for the outer 
shell, this is basically the regolith, the material that you find on the moon, no? like you're basically reusing the material. And then also maybe following up to Octavian's uh, question is how, how, how did this performs? You have now three layers, like a mesh and then another structure. And then on top of it, there's this uh, regolith three meter thick um, thing. Is that, is that the, the, the optimal way to do that? Can it be a bit more delicate or where does this kind of, um, like what is the, the, the concept? It, does it have to be like that to hold up? Um, I think uh, during during our the middle part of the semester, we were looking into um, termites and ants and how they behave. And I think it sort of it sort of generated from that idea of how termites and ants build their mounds. Um, so I think it sort of led from that approach um, to what it is now. Mm -hmm. Could it be also built only from the regolith with some? I, I think know. no. We yeah. found some research that actually said that you have to have support if you want to use it. I think well, Sachin is the one that. Sure. I think maybe if that's the case, that could have been, it, it wouldn't have to take a definitely different shape. You no, know, because we have another project actually looking into, for example, what uh, pure compression voltage structures with with which may in fact be able to work to just use regolith. And, but this is also considering all of the all of the non-technical factors of, of radiation and and sun and and, and insulation that the pro, assuming that those would work, uh, but just for the formal uh, outcome, I think in this case that the idea that they, that it would have a, a sh, rather like a shell structure that that uh, a grid shell structure that supports the, the regolith was to enable this a uh, rather free form. Um, environment that would create different ecosystems within the project. Correct me if I'm mistaken, guys, but uh, I, I, that's that's yep. Right now. okay. Yep. Um, I also wanted to add uh, to Zrinka's comment that the actually uh, the food um, production facility has been something that uh, the the whole group thought of. So mm -hmm. we in the presentations yesterday, we had another uh, group that was present presenting a food production um, plant that is closely located to the to this uh, project, and they were uh, planning to share some of the um, life and so, some of some of the uh, metabolic relationships. <laughs> okay. Sure. So that's kind of to relieve also the projects from from taking a a greater scope and more more focusing on some thing more specific mm -hmm. uh, but in this project in particular the scope was already great to the point that we have to narrow down the you know the, the scope of bringing the whole uh, all of the species to certain species and also uh, not dealing with uh, all of the parameters but maybe mainly just de dealing with uh, temperature and, and gravity and, and stuff that, they, that these guys are actually quite uh, addressing quite well um, um, Xavier, I don't know if you want to comment in, in spite of uh, uh, not having seen the, the whole presentation or maybe you want to save yourself for the next one. Uh, Xavier. Mm. Don't know. But maybe, maybe that means that we wait for the next one then. Um, Srinka, you, I'm not sure if you're going to manage to uh, to stay with us throughout the next the whole next presentation. Yeah, or... I have to leave in uh, how much? Like 24 minutes. So I hope uh, I can see the presentation. Sure. Um, I'm not sure if you're, um, I hope you get you get to to make it to the other day and otherwise um, just make a quick goodbye. Um, so let's then make it quickly. Group group five, are you are you ready to to rumble there? Yeah. Hi everyone. Okay, great. Can you ever see the screen now? See the screen and the yeah, we can see the uh, desk, background. the desktop background. <laughs> Sorry. 
There you go. We, uh, the, the, the renders make it to the background. Okay, so welcome everybody to the final presentation for a studio project that is called Lunar, that is a space residence. Um, so this is the project we did for the for the studio seminar. Um, and then we are group number five, that is Marisa Ritzwan, uh, Hesham Shakri, and myself, Herman Bodenmander. So we took a journey of 10 weeks, um, then we started taking a design research approach, and we started with research in materiality and constraints all the way to the final presentation that is today. Um, and the project index is going to take you through our very first, the initial and intention is a project vision all the way to materials, constructability, and the final renders. Starting from the beginning, one of the most important things for us is what is our vision and what is our guiding principles? So from the get-go, we define this idea that we want to create a self-sustainable community that does not just solve the technical challenges of living on the moon, but actually thrive on it. And also we embrace these five really important design drivers for us, the concept of modularity, adaptability, self-assembly, individuality, and opportunities of lunar gravity. That was quite important for us. So the question was, how can we create a modular approach that we can introduce multiple parts as the community grows? This will learn, uh, learn itself to the concept of adaptability and the community can grow and adapt based on the lunar needs. Then you can also embrace the concept of self-assembly using robotics and digital fabrication. And then this is quite tricky for us, but important is individuality. You know, using the using the, world, um, the idea of how we can create mass, custom, mass production, but mass customization as well. And then last one, and one of the most important for us, how we can understand the, the opportunities on the moon rather than constrain ourselves with the challenges. So in this particular scenario, how can we find new opportunities on embracing the lunar gravity? Final question is then, how can we then design a system that can react to the multiple lunar challenges? Uh, in terms of this, we look from different references, state of the art, and we took conceptual reference, architectural reference. Conceptual reference on the left, we researched a lot the concept of plug-in city by Archigram on how can we can create an overall mega structure that incorporates roads and session services for the habitants, and more granular to the concept of capsule homes um, and how we can create a kits of parts that create capsules that then create macro structures that can adapt. In terms of architectural references, we look into the Martian house, but the whole Broughton architects and the concept of modularity, and most important as well, you know, the concept of Lunark that has been developed by Saga Architects, and this is the Mark I. And how do we how can actually we can learn from this one the concept of micro living and deployable structures? Now I'll pass it to my colleague Marisa, they're just gonna talk about materiality. Marisa, you're muted. Yeah, hi, sorry. So um, the materiality, the there is the duality of materials that if you drive the design of our project, and, and this comes from the accessibility to the materials that are available on the moon. Because we need to be resourceful uh, with what we can produce on the moon um, and also to avoid bringing materials from Earth. And at the same time, we also need to address the, the radiation issue on the moon. So our construction material consists of um, the additive regolith, uh, which is the soil on the moon, on the surface of the moon. And then we have uh, inflatable skin system, which is pneumatic hydrogen. Um, hydrogen filled skin that protects the residents from uh, the radiation. and Actually, hydrogen acts as a good shield against uh, radiation because of the size of the particles and it's in fact um, protects us from radiation better than steel. And on the next slide, we can see uh, our resources. Um, there are two uh, sources for our raw material, uh, brown, um, the surface of the moon, uh, and the Shackleton crater for uh, water in the form of ice. Um, choosing this uh, location near the Shackleton crater was very important for, for the, for the, from the very beginning um, because of the proximity and availability of that material itself. Um, and also here you can see the energy requirements, uh, if we go back, for producing the elements. Both regular and ice can, can be produced, uh, can produce our hydrogen, but um, the ice is definitely a much more um, efficient way to produce it. And next, we will talk about program. Uh, living and thriving on the moon. So, in overall, we are looking at a program that can that can grow into the future, and like we are looking towards the future and planning for uh, Generation MO, uh, where we have moon native humans. And um, but to initiate this frontier of human existence, uh, this project sort of addresses the program requirements for the pioneer settlers, so the first 100 residents. Uh, but moving beyond that, we want a system that can adapt and grow to the, the needs of people who are going to come 
uh, and settle there. And on the next slide, we can see the uh, space requirements for the first 100 settlers. Um, we have private uh, living units, flexible enough to cater for individuals and families. And then we have the public uh, consisting of communal. Um, they have entertainment, multi-hall and communal uh, dining. Um, and also in this project, utilities are key in developing uh, the program because of the scarcity, the, the space that we need to, everything needs to be optimized. And so for the utilities, we decided to incorporate Luna Farming to be then able to create this cycle that feeds back the resident of the, the space set, uh, settlement. Um, and the relationship between the zones are organized to allow for that community to exist in the Luna colony. We have the communal programs, which are centralized multi-story spaces, and they're connected to the private living unit. And then we have the uh, utilities as the connectors to these two different levels of programs. Um, next, we look at parts design. And so to achieve uh, the intentions uh, of this project that has been mentioned, we've broken down the project into kits of parts. Uh, looking at micro, meso, uh, macro scale, and then to the entire, the level of the entire community. And on the next slide, you can see at the micro scale is the components catalog. Uh, they are all, the components are designed according to different activities at a very micro level, uh, eating, relax, sleep, uh, the basic level of activities. Uh, then the next slide, we see the meso scale, which here we have seven modules. In the entirety of our colony, we only have seven uh, modules. Um, we have the communal column, the communal, the connection, vertical and horizontal, and we have three different living unit modules. Um, and on the next slide, uh, we see how the components actually come together to create the various different uh, typology for the living units I just mentioned in the previous slide. Um, here, this is actually key to the customization that Herman was talking about for the users depending on the, what they want, depending on the, uh, uh, who they are, their families or the individuals, the ability to adapt to, to uh, different uh, spaces. And then uh, here we see the circulation module. Um, the, these connections actually carry the life support of the project and uh, they bring in all the necessary um, utilities and also the unit, the farming unit that can be housed in the project. And then on the next one, this explains sort of like the breakdown of uh, the far Luna farm and how much space we actually need to feed a person for a year. We need two square meters. And then these, also, these units also carry the hydrogen, the fresh water, the waste and all of that. And it's actually quite essential and it's not just a circulation space. And I'll now pass it on to Hasham to talk about manufacturing. So we designed our units to protect people inside these, these units from lunar radiations. Uh, so these are, the units are constructed from many layers to create sort of shelter, taking into consideration different aspects like privacy and spatial quality and how we can embrace lunar gravity. So we have six main layers, the structure frames, the structure nodes, the weave fabrics and flitter mesh and the windows and air lockers and then the interior elements. And all of these parts should assemble together to create the residential units. Uh, so at at the beginning, we are creating our structured elements. So this construction process starts with 3 printing uh, the uh, vertical structure rods uh, using 3 printed regolith. And we are using the same technology and the same materials for creating our structural nodes. And then we are using uh, a robot arm and the human labor to assemble uh, the structured nodes and the structure members together to create the skeleton of the unit. And uh, and again, we are using uh, uh, a precasted interior elements to be assembled inside the whole structure. And here we are using a different, uh, a different robotic arm to create a weaved structure uh, that goes around the structural elements. And that weave fabric should hold the structure together and later support the inflatable mesh. And also we are using another robot arm connected with a hydrogen tank that uh, exists Below the ground to create the inflatable mesh and to push hydrogen inside that mesh to make it more resistant, as we mentioned, to different balloon radiations. And as a, as a final layer, we are just adding windows and air lockers to finalize uh, the units. And then I will pass it to my colleague, Herman, to talk about aggregation systems. 
Thank you. So after we have defined the rules, the parts, um, and all the, the materiality of the system, we then jump into the macro scale. That is about aggregation. So for this scenario, then we needed to look for a system that allows us to take all the multiple parts and then be able to create a series of type of aggregation we can control. And that's what it leads us to the concept of stochastic aggregation. So stochastic aggregation allows us to create a modular growth using all the parts we have created and at the end, be able to create an adaptive structure. So this stochastic aggregation allows us to define a really specific series of rules and adjacencies that each part will have. Also identify the field of growth and inform how the community, how the aggregation is to grow. And then last but important is also to define a series of volumes that allow us to constrain um, the areas in which the community needs to grow. So this diagram briefly explains the process on how this aggregation happens. So the idea is we can set, we can set up either one or multiple starting points for the aggregation, as you can see here, allow us to then define neighbors, neighborhood connections on which the, the direction the community needs to grow. And this allows us to create multiple scenarios. Scenario A, that is the initial sentiment that it just has one center. And then we can go all the way to multiple scenarios like C, when the community grows, the amount of people in the demographic grows as well and allow us to create multiple centers aggregations approach. So then we get to the point we need to define the rules of engagement of all the, our, our unique seven different parts. And as you can see, the parts here are at the top and at the bottom left, this is a series of technical rules we have informed the algorithm to use. And this allow us to create seven different parts um, connection. And as you can see now the catalog is growing and we go to 71 parts. And this is all the different ways on our parts can connect. So then we run a very first aggregation. We're really, really excited about it and allow us to then control the amount of parts based on demographics. However, um, we still didn't have all the control and the depth we wanted. So then we push a step further and we create a, a process that has a static component and a dynamic component. The static component on the left is when the part, when we design the parts and these interiors. And then after that's done, we jump into a dynamic component. That is through a computational process, we then use a series of sliders to then inform the rules then to inform how many parts and the hierarchy of the parts. And then we add a, new, a really important process for us that is the analysis process. We then create structural analysis, radiation analysis, the most important circulation analysis. This then allow us to understand if this particular configuration is actually good or not. This is now a screenshot of the linear process that we have created. So we ended up creating a single script that actually allow us through the virtue of speckle also to decentralize the script into multiple computers and cloud-based systems. And then we introduce WASP in order to take care, take, take care of the irrigation scenario. Then we introduce Radiance, Lady, um, Ladybug, and Honeybee to run and Caramba to run the structural um, the analysis part. And then we use Rhino Insight and Speckle to move the data across the scenarios. And because this become quite a complex and automated process, we then design an own app that we call it the Lunar Configurator. That we, we make it happen using human UI. And this configurator takes care of the entire process, creating an automatic and connected workflow. For this one, we have created a quick video that will take you through the process of how the Lunar configurator works. And as you can see here on the very first step, when we launch the configurator, this is when the client interface, interface with, the, with the scenario, where it defines the starting points and the multiple connection points. This can be changed at any time and the whole aggregation will react. New neighbors can arrive and new developments on the community can happen and aggregation will happen. Then scenario B, when we show the field of aggregations, and then scenario C, when we can define the volume of constraint. This helps us to inform how the community needs to grow and in which areas. Then we run to scenario two, that is about the aggregation. So we move to the second tab. This is the very first time we run the aggregation and we can decide how many parts we want the aggregation to happen. At the very beginning, the aggregation will run with 10 parts and as the community grow, we keep adding modular components into it. After we're happy with the amount of parts that we have, let's say for instance, in this scenario, we've got 500 parts. Then we establish the hierarchy of the different parts. And here we can tell how many four people units, how many two people units, how much vertical circulation horizontal. And after we happy with this one, then we actually move to the analysis tab. So this is when we invite a structural and environmental engineer and they help us to run a workability analysis. Then a second, a radiation analysis and third, a structural analysis. And as you can see here, all the different analysis appears on the screen and we got all the data displayed. Then the question was for us, okay, how can we now analyze 100 different options at the same time? So then we run a, a seed generation export, and this is connected live with a Google spreadsheet that is live receiving all the data and creating charts on, on the go. So this was a total of 53 different aggregations, and as you can see, all the data is coming there. 
these visual charts help us to then, out of, all, all, out of these thousand multiple options, to choose the best, most performing aggregations. And you will see now we ended up choosing aggregation 15. That is the first red, red dot on the left. That is the best seed performing both structurally and in thermal radiation as well. And then after we're happy with this, we get to the beam exporting process that is connected live using Revit Insight, um, Rhino Insight. And here we create the levels, the grids, the sites, the communal parts, and so on. And we also create an automatic Revit families for the interiors, for the structure, and for the skin as well. And it's not just the geometry. This is proper native Revit families with all the embedded data. And after that, we decided to publish a project to the cloud so we can share it with the digital fabricators, the possible clients, and the prospective users. So now if you click on that one, it opens the live stream on Speckle. And as you can see here, this is the project streaming live on the link that we're going to share with you after. And this is not just the geometry, it's also about all the embedded data analytical results that we took from it. Um, now, I'm going to pass it up. And then as an as output of this process, this is some of the screenshots we have taken. This is the documentation we have created using Rhino Insight. All this process is automated. And as you can see here, we created all the different components of the families, and we break it in components into multiple parts. Uh, we have done this for all the different units that we have. In this case, we should show in the two, uh, the two people units, technical documentation for it, four people units as well, axonometrics, uh, sections and elevations. And then as you can see here, is this is not just geometry, as I said before, this is all the data. So if you can see on the table on the top, this is the Revit schedule that is live quantifying how many units we have, how many uh, nodes, how many cubic meters of material. So for instance, on this particular aggregation, there is aggregation uh, 15, we have 84,000 cubic meters of regolith. That is quite a lot, but this is the full community aggregated over the three years. And because we have the lunar configurator at any point in time, we can actually just modify any of the parameter and the whole process will update automatically. So this is documentation also happening live, all automated using Rhino Insight, view templates, sections and filters. And I will pass it to my colleague Hisham. So after uh, pushing things to the BIM side, we started to uh, create uh, our logic for this construction system for the whole community. So we wanted to create a flexible and dynamic dynamic construction process that can accommodate the structural modularity and adaptability. And the process that can really allow future growth and expansion of this community. So we designed uh, connection nodes between different parts to be flexible enough to for future recycling and mobility of different units. And the process should go as a following. So we start with creating a unit, different structural elements and component assembly. And after that, we move these units using space drones to be connected with different connection nodes and to different circulation elements. And then we also using a different, a three printed scaffolding system to construct the bigger structures inside our community. And then we can see a closer, closer perspectives for these different stages. So on the next slide, we see how we start manufacturing different units, starting from the frames and the skin. And then we see how we are using uh, different uh, machines and different elements for different units and how we are using also uh, space drones to move units from one place to another. And then uh, we can see the three printed holding system to support the bigger structures. And from that, we can move to our final aggregation system and the visualization. So this is the final, and the next slide, we can see the final configuration of our, our, our aggregated community. And here we are creating main circulation paths uh, using the LNS system to be connected with different neighbors. And we can also see how we are creating different voids in between these units to enhance the spatial quality and user experience inside the community, and also to enhance daylighting coming through all of these units. And also the idea behind creating different nodes, a uh, bigger structure, the three communal parts that we can see here uh, is mainly based on social aspects. So people can actually identify their units by the visual contact between them and the landmarks inside our community. And also to create a gathering, uh, gathering social nodes for people to uh, interact and socialize uh, like in these units. And in the next slide, we can see a, a, a zoom in chart for, for the, like the whole aggregation inside our community. And then, um, yeah, this is an anterior shot from inside one of, one of the circulation parts. 
And from the circulation parts, we can get access to different units and actually we can have different uses for circulation parts to host farming system. Here, another shot from one of the interior, uh, from one of the units. And then uh, elevation view for the whole community showing different levels and the skyline of the, of the project. And this is a final, uh, this is a last perspective showing our spatial organization for the residential units, the scan details, how people are living inside these small residential units, and how we were always trying to keep the social interaction between the people inside the community to enhance a new way of living on the moon surface. And on the next slide, we, we can see how, uh, how was our progress uh, through different weeks starting from the very low abstract uh, aggregation until, uh, until the final aggregation that we have now. It was very hard to control the aggregation rules and the growth, but somehow, yeah, through different ways, we added more layers uh, to really make the community work and really make people can actually work, uh, actually work inside these circulation parts to get different units. Um, and then we, we tried to use different techniques that we learned this semester to link our, our project uh, to web systems. So we created a, a website interface so different people can get access to our, our, our online drum tree. Uh, it's coming in one second. Should we start with the website? Yeah. 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 So as you, as you can see here, this is a part of the lateral seminars we have created. So we have created a single website. We have created a repository for the information. So on this one, if you click on, on this aggregation, as you can see, this is a, a small snippet of the code that we have pushed to the cloud, but it creates an, uh, you can create uh, your own uh, lunar community based, uh, based on the rules we have defined. And here you can react with this one and move it around. And at the same time, you can place a position in multiple ways, increase the amount of uh, performance, and it's also actually running to, uh, your radiation performance as well. So as you can see here, you can modify the legends and we share the link now in the chat, you can access this one. And then if you go back, um, then after you run this one, our very final aggregation, then it gets produced here. So you can also this link. And this is now the final aggregation that has been pushed into the cloud using Rhino Compute. Um, so now you can explore more into detail how, how the aggregation goes and connects and reacts to the different scenarios, the distribution, the communal parts, and the different things. And this one, uh, we couldn't push the, the, the final mesh, the protective mesh into it in terms of um, size. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Catch your, you have thank, to catch, thank you. catch your breath, you there, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Take a minute to catch your breath. It's been, uh, it's, it's been a lot. There's a lot of really interesting stuff to digest in your presentation. Um, feel free to, to share the, the link in, the, in chat if you, want to, if you want people to configure a way yeah. in your project. Uh, and uh, thanks a lot for being thorough and concise and trying to keep it on time. Um, yeah, uh, impressive, really. I I think maybe, um, I don't know if Xavier wants to start with this one. Yeah, that's right. Sorry that I was late and this is the first one that I kind of saw fully, so I wasn't able to kind of comment on, on the previous one. Um, well, first of all, hey, con massive congratulations. That's an amazing amount of work that you guys did in uh, in, in, in 10 weeks. Um, really impressive, uh, especially around the whole process that you went through, uh, the whole BIM process, but then also kind of making your kind of lunar configurator there and, 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 and the web link and all that. Really, really impressive. Um, so, um, if, I've got a few comments, but, um, you know, I think on the, around, the, around the fabrication thing, I think that is not very um, realistic, I think, you know, 3D printing the nodes with regular 3D printing the struts with regular, I think um, you probably would want to do that uh, with prefabricated elements that, that, that came from Earth anyway, a process like this. So, I don't think that's very realistic. I also don't you know, not sure how your drones are going to fly in a, if you don't have actually an, an atmosphere. Um, I'm not sure what your propulsion system is for this, for those drones. Um, so I think there's a, there's a bit of an overcomplication there in your um, manufacturing and and, and and a fabrication process. I would, for example, also do it in an in an uh, controlled environment. You know, you kind of show your your EVA astronauts putting stuff together 
Um, I think that's that's not that realistic. I think you would probably create almost kind of your own little factory, which is in a pressurized environment to put these things together. Um, but, you know, that's, that's really my, my, my main uh, critique on the project. And what, what I really kind of like as well that you start to think about, and I'm thinking about it myself, is um, how do communities grow, right? Or, you know, if you have 10 people living together, they probably have their own communal uh, place where they go and eat, right? and live but what about 20 30 40 50 people you know what what are the spaces that become communal what are the places that become individual you kind of like you know uh point to that a little bit but I'm, I'm really interested in kind of you know what if it's like 200 300 people what are the extra spaces that that that, that become communal and um so i think that's that's a really interesting discussion point that we can have now where we don't need to have um what that means for a community right have you so my question really is there have you looked at earth analogs or earth locations of communities where you can say well you know that we used as as an example you know you looked at for example um small villages or you could look uh, indigenous tribes or you could look at antarctic bases or something like that so the last one was a question the other ones were just comments <laughs> so maybe maybe I, I would like to answer your first comment thanks for the feedback but regarding our pre-casted structural elements because we want to optimize how much load we are carrying from earth to the moon that's why we're looking for yeah. different techniques to 3 print our structural nodes and and the, regarding the drones you know, we are calling them space drones because now they are exploring different different techniques to make uh, drones really fly on the moon using uh, uh, fuel. So that's why we uh, we wanted to use drones to move these units from like ground level to upper levels. But now maybe uh, if someone else wants to answer the, 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 the most important question, which poses that we look for. Yeah, maybe, so I, think, yeah. I think regarding the program, and this is a really interesting point because and something we said right at the beginning of the seminar is we we taken a lot of assumption from Earth and we projected into the moon that the moon is a completely different environment. So it's a lot of assumptions and now they need to be revisited and how do we live on the moon. And for that, we were looking into different examples of the Earth, like communal living um, and also, you know, especially a lot of things on Antarctica. That's why also we brought a lot of examples from Saga architects, you know, because they ended up being an encapsulated scenario. But then that when it becomes more people, it needs to be able to then connect to a major system. Um, so that's a real challenge for us. That's why what we thought is we develop three phases, zero, one, and two. Um, and then phase one is like these more like isolated capsules. We connect to a big communal space. And then as the community grows, then we introduce newer parts. Like for instance, you know, after we 20 years on the moon, we're going to have having the first infants <laughs> being first born in the moon. So we need different type of facilities and crash and things like that. So for that, we ended up introducing newer parts that will connect through circulation. Indeed. Um, um, sorry, if I may, I also, want, I, I also want to say that, that one of the interesting aspects of this uh, is that even if you take away the, the lunar uh, all of all of what's uh, relevant to the lunar agenda here, the project still kind of entangles and and deals with a lot of other concepts that may be applied to to deserts, to to Antarctica, to um, different types of regions in the in the Earth, which might indeed have to more, have probably more need for this uh, feature of modularity and stochastic growth that you propose now, which in in a way also. Uh, tangentially touches aspects of eco of economy, of of circularity, of uh, some aspects that are really relevant in in the uh, in trendy nowadays in, in I think in architecture. So like decommodification as well. Absolutely, decentralization. Mm. Um, if I can, if I can just add something, I think I think it's really what what you just mentioned, Xavier. Like. Um, you know, a colony that is like 2,000 people and a colony that is 100 people looks completely different with different characteristics. And, and the aggregator gives us that characteristics. What we put in the aggregator is, is what the character of the, 
uh, the aggregate the rules are. So I think in just looking forward after post project, um, I think there's definitely something that we can add into, like add more rules into the aggregator because at the moment, uh, I think I mentioned before that it was just looking at 100 settlers. And, and for the rule of 100 settlers, uh, we have a communal hub and we have three communal hubs. So 30 units, will, like uh, 30 people will connect to the hub. So it's sort of in a way like to that scope, but to expand it for sure, you know, 2000 inhabitants will look completely different to 100, I think. Absolutely. Um, Octavian, Julian, I don't know if yeah. you guys. Know. I wanted to. I'm now gonna switch my hat to the <laughs> academic hat. Uh, so I want to congratulate you because you articulated well, very well your project and your concept, and the fact that you are situating the project using references it creates that architectural discourse that is quite important. Um, and uh, towards the end, you see the conversation goes into this almost nature of, of politics and economy. And what's interesting for me in your project is exactly that. Whatever you're doing can be applied in other contexts as well. So take the moon, put it on earth, and this could be a clever way of doing housing, or it can be a clever way of doing some other things, right? Developing communities and the problem of growth is actually a super interesting problem, especially in a city that has to adapt to both expansion and contraction. So that's what's interesting. Going to that point, I think you're understanding a bit your computation, especially the way you're uh, solving the parts assembly. Um, I'm not sure what's, what's driving behind uh, your computation. I'm assuming is wave function collapse. That's why, I, or I hope you're using that for parts constrain and using wave function collapse to constrain the parts. That that part for me was massively understood because it's one of the interesting tools you can use as a generative design tool. And uh, it's also a way to explore design option, right? So you can give it to someone, let's say other designers or maybe other architects to start to design their own version of this, right? So it's a, a incredible exploration tool which I would have loved to see a bit more of how you talk about it. And it's super nice you put it in a website. I think that's, uh, that's super good. Um, I'm thinking going forward that try to make it almost like collaborative in this sense, right? Like give it to some of your friends that might be designers or give it to other people who are not designers and ask them to come up with solutions and create a system that records the solution and start to evaluate them in some form, right? So we could be evaluated of structural performance, of space distribution quality, and so on and so forth, which can be also a way to produce more interesting solutions. So for example, if you're using something like wave function collapse that just solves tau to tau connection based on constraints, yeah, it will give you a solution, but it might not be an interesting solution. If you add some intelligence, then it can be using either a genetic algorithm or some machine learning as a layer to automatically decide, like, is this better than something else, right? And you can decide, like, what can we use? If it is a machine learning, then you need a database of solutions that are classified, some are good, some are bad. If you're using a genetic algorithm, you need a set of parameters that uh, start to find within the solution set something that is optimal based on your input, right? So you, it, it's, you're in a very good place because you can now explore that. And the last thing I want to commend you is on the quality of your presentation. And again, I appreciate it because the drawings were very beautiful and your diagrams were very beautiful. So again, you find yourself a good job to put that forward. So yeah, well done. Maybe. I'm, I'm sorry, Yus, before you go, I just want to address the second point that you, you mentioned, Octavian, because um, I think so. I think these guys have actually established this workflow and then at the end show a, an evaluation criteria that they, that they propose, which is nice because, of course, with all of this, uh, with this iterative process uh, and being able to generate so many iterations, um, you, must, you must have, you cannot actually 
visually evaluate this as a, as as somehow as a human being. Now, there's there's aspects that there, that uh, environmental aspects, structural aspects, and 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 also engineering aspects that can be included in this evaluation, which can be objective, no? But in a way, I also think that empowering people to choose from these options and from different evaluations and the, and the different trade-offs that this might have is a valuable asset, no? Because some of these um, evaluations can be somehow contradictive. No? You, you, most of the times you cannot just, uh, uh, most of these criteria are, it's not aiming for the, you know, it's not absolute in the sense that you can actually um, you can actually increase all of the performances altogether, but you would have to choose among them. And I think it's nice in the ways that you empower the designer or, or, or the user to choose from these options. Uh, at least, uh, I think from my perspective, that's quite, that's quite cool. Uh, also, feel free to, to to play around with the configurator that that Herman just posted in, in chat, where you can configure the the, the project yourself. Maybe I, maybe I can add just three comments. I think I, it's a it's a very structured, very well structured presentation. I really enjoyed following it. I think the modularity approach is a very nice way to also make uh, the project a bit more realistic because it, the the pre prefabrication might not necessarily work on the outside on the moon, but it 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 has some like it it becomes more realistic a bit comparable to the prefabrication of timber elements. And I think it's a it's a very clear approach also. Um, in these terms, what I really enjoyed in the in the end, I'm gonna jump to the end, is that you managed to take all the data from the model and all the module, like the environmental data into Revit. No, and you you were actually able to show that via a native Revit schedule, and this is I, I wanted to ask this question or it I, I wrote it down but then you answered it with this like beautifully done sheet that is that is a native Revit. What what I think could be improved in the process I don't know if I understood it right but the, the transfer of the data is like coming from Rhino and going through Rhino inside directly into Revit do you kind of uh, consider the modularity like are you would it be interesting to also use kind of like uh, uh let's say a number module one two three four that you're having and then by these kind of numeric data generate these modules from the same kind of setup in revit so that you don't transfer all the geometry to revit but you have kind of this set up by numerical data. Is that happening already? Or uh, did you take this into consideration? So <clears throat> the current workflow at the moment um, was, and also because of the, the other seminars that we have to explore in using Speckle and Rhino Insight, is using both Speckle and Rhino Insights as the vehicles for it. Mm -hmm. But as an as a after, afterthought, like a future implementation, I mean, like you said, it's, it's really data heavy because you're really pushing a lot of things. when when actually a mapping exercise would be more accurate because at the end of the day from grasshopper you can inform on this particular coordinate system if this dna yeah. and then on revit through dynamo it just reads a really quick database and what it does is place the components into it and allows to you know to have the design environment and the construction environment um but i think it's it can be op definitely optimizing and also push it through the clouds uh, in, a, in a way that you can then becomes completely Physicalists, I don't know if that's a correct world, you know, but don't rely on a, on a specific computer. But so, you create the creation process in Revit is also done via these uh, kind of location codes, and then you place the modules, or is that, yeah? It's all, yeah. So actually, Revit, it's right now, it's just a, it has become a window yeah, yeah. that is just to print the sheets. And the, actually, the biggest limitation we have is that actually Rhino Insight yet doesn't have any options for you to create the views within Rhino inside. Uh, so you have to create the views first. So, but then the idea would the process would be then to run inside, then you go into Dynamo. Dynamo creates all the views and automate all the process and then just receive it. So for instance, right now, this, this image that you see on the screen, if you open the, the whole configuration live, we can go back and just relocate the community into a different surface spot 
define the, the, the merger parts, and this will update in like, like 20, 20 seconds kind of process and just comes back again. Very nice. I have one more question. It's actually for, for um, it's actually a wider question. Um, as I see all these projects actually working together on, on the same site on the moon, right? Yeah, have you guys um, working on a way that all the projects together become uh, like an unreal walkthrough or something like that? Is that what you guys are doing as well? Or is that, I'd love to kind of be able to kind of walk around all of them together. You know, is there, uh, has that connection happened or not? Right. So yeah, the, the, the idea was to, in the end, uh, generate one stream where we would put all of the projects together. But uh, I, I think in the end, the projects are so fresh that we didn't manage to, to include all of them together. But if indeed you can actually visit all of the projects uh, separately now with different streams, but for sure, I mean, uh, That's amazing, I think even at the end of the, you know, after the Chris to, to be able to do that and have a browser based uh, version of that, that would be uh, super sweet, I think, right? I think, I think so too. So you, uh, so you have my word that you will get, get a link from us with a stream cool. of all of the projects uh, together where you can see them in at least the, the least amount of resolution that you can, you can at least work through mm -hmm. them. No? But for now, you can access that link that we shared on, on Zoom so if you want to have a walk, a walk through inside our model on, on yeah, I'm going to try that out. This is one, well, yeah, one model. Yeah. So, cool. so, I mean, just very briefly to, to, to also talk about the technologies that we're using. And aside from Rhino, from Rhino inside Revit, we're also there we're using Rhino Compute to, to create these uh, configurators. And also, we're using the version two speckle of. of the version two of Speckle, which is recently released. And I have to say that for both technologies, we've been um, kind of pushing the boundaries also on the limitations of the, of the platforms now. So not only in terms of the capabilities of going back and forward, but also on the capabilities of the servers to maintain uh, a life in a way. And that's something that the guys have been experiencing, I think throughout the, the whole semester. Um, yeah, thanks guys. Uh, I, I really have to congratulate you for this project, not just this final instance, but all of the instances that you showed uh, and the different steps that you took back and forth to, 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 to take this project to this state. So uh, round of applause. Uh, let's, uh, let's, let's head on to the next project in the community, which I believe is the meditation temple, right? We have also included this on the on the brief. Oh wait, um, shall we? Perhaps I don't know if we if we. Yeah, this this was actually time for the little for a little break. I don't know if you guys want to take five minutes to stretch your legs before we go. Um, that said, I don't know, uh, Julian, would you would you mind if we stay a little bit after uh, one? For the presentation. It's fine, and it's good to take a little break. Huh? Uh, Xavier, uh, you don't mind staying a little bit uh, longer because we have two more groups. Oh, fine. Fine. I have fun. I have fun. I have fun. I have fun. Yeah. Okay. Great. Excellent. Let's let's maybe take it just a stre uh, leg stretcher, uh, mm -hmm. five minutes, and then quick, quick coffee challenge to to come back and, and resume the presentations. And we come back to the temple. Octavian, you're also good to to. Are you good to stay for a little longer? Uh, let me see. I have a meeting at 12, but it might get cancelled, so I'll let you know in 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I think we'll need a, a little break. Okay, awesome. Let's, uh, let's be back in five minutes, guys. See you, see you in a bit.
Hello, hello. Hello. Hey, uh, was there enough time to make a coffee? Yeah, <laughs> I got one. Yeah, it's blur. When you put it outside of your head, it gets blurred. Uh, you'll see. There you go. It's like sensor, sensor cheap coffee, you know? It's a nice cup, no? It's, <laughs> when you put it outside, it looks like uh, it... there would be a swear word in your, in your coffee. I mean, coffee mug. <laughs> I love this hacking that you can put a piece of paper or something to hide some of your face features, and then the algorithm doesn't pick up and you become either transparent or blurred. Is it? It's oh. very good. Ah, that works. So this this is the Zoom feature, no? You also what? Yeah, well, this one. If you want to do something fun, you can put like a baseball cap or something, and then it really screws up the algorithm. <laughs> is it? Let's, let's not give any any ideas here. With uh, so many so many Zoom meetings, it can just get crazy, too crazy. Hmm. Um, the, okay, we, we guess we're back. What are um, you using? We are back. Sorry. We call we call this the the the, the five minute break coffee challenge and. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you I don't know who managed, but usually our students are getting very proficient at making uh, five minutes warm uh, warm drinks in between the, the sessions. <laughs> um, not sure, uh, Kike, did you get a chance to see the last project, which which was kind of very high rabbit intensive? Yeah, it was was impressive. I, I still impress it. I mean. <laughs> uh, they also talked about certain features that may, might, you know, help in the improvement of the development. We we know that the views are missing. I mean, uh, Revit API is so so big, and uh, Revit itself has a lot of features that are still not uh, wrapped properly in the software. But we hope we hope to have it soon. <laughs> is that a plan? I feel is it a plan, or I feel like the wrapping at the end is more coming from Rhino inside Revit than from the. Revit API themselves now. <laughs> well, some things are missing, but there are a lot still to, to do. Uh, okay, uh, let's let's see the the temple projects, shall we? Can, can you guys, we start? Can you guys see the screen? Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, for the juries. Um, Take a look at the plans, uh, the Revit plans, that the uh, documentation that they were throwing in the chat uh, for each of the projects. And for the students, remember to keep an eye on the clock for the. So take it away, guys. Awesome. Hello, everyone. We're group three consisting of Amal, Krishna, Pedro, and myself, Varun. And we welcome you all to the Meditation Temple Moonscape. We will start off by sharing the vision of our project with some referential triggers the development of form followed by the fabrication process and our collaborative workflow. Kevin Kelly's nine laws of God extracted from the whole earth catalog heavily inspired the vision for this project. It reads, when the sum of parts can add up to more than the parts, then the extra being something from nothing is distributed amongst the parts. While respecting the diversity of various religions, rituals and beliefs, with this project, we aim to create a universal space that would invoke a sense of love, community, and collective purpose by focusing on self-discovery. We hope to mold the same through advanced and sustainable methods of construction. We start off with uh, references and some research for the project. So following the vision of the project, we looked at uh, uh, the third temple for all humankind, where uh, many religions come together and create this universal space. Um, next slide. Another reference was the Matri Mandir in Norville, which also is a temple for the collective consciousness. And here we also looked at the spatial organization respected to the silent zones with main ring circulation in between. Uh, we looked at uh, references which expresses the importance of a focal point and also the importance of light. 
Uh, we also have uh, another set of uh, references of project proposals on the moon to understand the context environment, its challenges, its opportunities, and also methods of construction for our project. So uh, the first one we looked at is the moon temple. And uh, the, uh, we also, um, here we also look at the simplicity and the neutrality of a program and the form in such an out of the world context. We look at uh, two other projects, Regolith, uh, Regolite and the Masha. The first project investigates the process of printing lo lunar regolith by means of concentrated sunlight. And Masha shows the viability of 3D printing uh, structure as a structural solution, and also its dual shell approach, allowing the interiors to be free from other constraints. After researching on different materials and techniques, we chose uh, two approaches for 3D printing and materials. One is the use of uh, renewable bioplastics such as PLA, binded with uh, other strong materials such as cement or basalt fiber, and other is solar sintering and uh, laser sintering of regolith. So basalt is abundant on the lunar surface and mixing it with PLA, we get this extremely strong uh, durable material which shields from radiation is non-conductive and also non-toxic. This material is also known for us, making it ideal for the interior spaces. The lunar regolith is, on the other hand, is a very strong material with high thermal mass and can protect from meteor, micrometeor impacts and also radiation. And this material is porous and hence it's ideal for exterior protective layer. And now we talk about the design development. Our design development laid its foundation on four agendas that we established, allowing moon settlers to isolate within themselves completely while encoving a journey of growth, connecting different programs, people, and unifying them into one. The evolution of sacred geometry from a single circle to the flower of life and the Metatron's cube played a huge role in expanding our understanding while creating a universal space for all. Our agendas were translated into eight different experiences within the form, spanning from the intimacy of prayer, self-exploration through group meditation and isolation, a point of focus of collective alignment, a viewpoint from the peak, and volumetric expanses fluctuating within the temple, all of which facilitate self-realization. Our form is molded into multiple parts converging into one higher point while creating an experiential journey representing the perpetual cyclic renewal of life and infinity. The silhouette of this form is divided into two portions, the external and the internal temple, symbolizing the external material world and the world that lies within oneself. This approach has allowed us to split the form into multiple layers, shielding the interior spaces from the harsh radiation. Within the interiors, the temple, the areas are subdivided into four main levels, creating a spectrum between communal and silent zones. The underground LNS connection marks a safe entry point into the structure, creating communal spaces for meeting, followed by level one, having three different kinds of flexible worship plus prayer rooms, along with individual cells for isolated meditation on the periphery. Lastly, level two containing completely silent group meditation chamber in form of a step well. The exterior portion of the temple also has an alternate access from the outside that connects the topmost viewpoint. So from the conceptual explorations and the spatial distribution, we were left with this uh, towering structure that rises from the terrain and merges into one. So we had several ap approaches to formalizing this, where we had a concave tower rising up and then a more convex shape, which we thought might be more suitable for 3D printing construction technique, but it kind of deviates from the initial conceptual form. Finally, we decided to have this uh, multi-layered approach with a combination of both the concave and convex geometries, keeping in mind the construction methods, which we will be explaining later. So the multi-layer approach gave us a way to introduce openings into the 3D printed structure and also have a control over the, over the openings. So bringing in sunlight from the exterior temple was a key factor for the exterior temple was a key factor for a form deriving process. So we controlled the openings and ran evolutionary solvers to optimize the form for the light. Sun vectors are calculated on the lunar south pole and we ran a sunlight hour analysis on the form and the openings are optimized based on this. And since the sunlight is mostly horizontal, we divided the analysis surface vertically 
and uh, based on the sunlight requirement of each area, the form is optimized. So you can see here the the top view point where uh, large uh, has the large openings and is mostly most away from the interior spaces. The middle region through which the light is brought into the interior has maximum variation in sunlight, uh, reflecting the dynamic nature of sunlight as in Earth. And the bottom part, which houses the interior spaces, have less sunlight to reduce radiation. So here we have the different genes for optimizing the openings, so changing the rotation and density of the layers and the catalog of uh, the selected iterations are displayed, of which we have selected the best performing three individuals. And finally, we have the selected iteration. We, uh, next slide. We also run a sunlight analysis over the final individual to inform us of the individual, uh, the interior openings to, through which the sunlight is going into the interior part of the temple. And then we talk about the main temple design. We've split the form into nine different layers to organize our 3D modeling process and our design process amongst all four contributors. These layers of forms, although modeled in different modeling tools, were combined into one file and assigned Revit categories. The segregation also simplified our coordination through Speckle into linear set of streams for easy updation and optimization. Now we, now we are going a bit more in detail through the plans. Uh, at the ground floor, it's located the support services for the temple, as well as the connection with the neighbor buildings through the docking port. In this floor, uh, three access points lead to a different staircases uh, going to the worship uh, in the level above. The space here is visually connected through the light court centrally. On level one, flexible prayer and worship rooms seamlessly unfold themselves into a circulation in office space with a tempering ramp connecting to the main meditation hall above. On plan two, a central space is defined by its oversized dome, scaling the human to, to, a, to a small element. This complex, complex silent zone has a radial focus in form as a stepped well in the direction light following from the side and visually connected to the ex external shell from the top. On top of the spiral out, outdoor, um, you, can, you can connect visually with her. Here, the view over the, over the colony, it's meant to empower the visitor with energy and positivity um, for his journey on the moon. We can see, we can see now um, how these spaces uh, relate to, with each other through the section. Here becomes also clear the two spaces that compose the temple, the internal part of the temple, pressurized, and the external part of the temple, open to exterior conditions leading to the top. Um, our fabrication process is based on the 3D uh, printing concept using lunar regoliths. Uh, once, once in the moon, the first step is, it, it would be to have a series of rovers building up the ramps and the base where most of the program will be located and protected. At the same time, uh, the central space at the same time that at, at the central space starts to get uh, shaped by the ramps 3D printing cranes, similar to the WASP 3D printing crane process can be placed and allow the shells uh, and interiors to be printed in a radial axis using a lunar regolith for the exterior and PLA basalt for interior. With, with the 3D printing fabrication in mind, as mentioned, we have built an exterior shell based on the convex and concave forms. By doing it, we, we intend to create a balance between shells that allow a wider a convex space, as well as the dense, as, as well as the, sh the shell structure to increase shielding and lower and lower down radiation. The exterior shell will be supporting the ramps through the interlock inter through an interlock system, together with a series of 3D printed fabricated elements in in situ, using um, solar uh, energy. I'm going to pass to Amal. 
Yeah, so um, as we say, the goal is to construct and print the whole building in one go. So we are thinking at different layers at once. Uh, so the third layer would be uh, shell C, which is uh, the enclosed pressurized uh, protected space. So for the printing process, uh, it starts with the base and it starts printing the ground floor, which, uh, which consists of entry and the stairs. Then after that, the first floor with rounds that will take to the step well level. After that, the inner boundary layer will be printed. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, the outer boundary layer uh, will be printed and the openings will be integrated. And at the end, uh, the skylight will be uh, integrated into the building. So uh, we were very inspired by the components of the 3D printed uh, printing. So um, also in terms of making it a better thermal performance. Uh, so all, usually the 3D printed wall consists of cavity, mass, and insulation chamber, which is almost reflected in the way uh, our spatial uh, organization became through these three different layers where we have the external boundary and the internal boundary that uh, created a buffer and a cavity uh, area between the two layers, which uh, created somehow that spatial hierarchy that is generated by these multiple layers of the 3D printing typology, which created that unique in-between space uh, that is accessed by, by the RAMs. And uh, once you access that space, you will uh, see the water feature uh, in the middle of that space. So um, our uh, primary structure will be uh, constructed from uh, ammon resources. We have only one earth package, which is uh, will consist of penetrations that will be fabricated on earth, flown to moon, and integrated into the primary structure. These windows designed to integrate perfectly with the 3D structure. So first uh, element, we have the skylight, and we have the windows, and we have the doors. So uh, first, the skylight, uh, this is a top view, which um, uh, show the, the, how the light penetrates from that dome, reflecting into that water uh, in the step well. And the second uh, element, which is the windows, um, where actually um, it consists of two panels of polycarbonate, one to hold the internal pressure and one to protect the pressure panel and also consists of a layer of operable louvers that magnetically uh, control to regulate the light and, and, and um, coming into the space. So basically, um, uh, can you go back? Uh, so the louvers will, will be uh, automatically moving in different degrees uh, in order to control the safety of the space and uh, the pressure. And also the integration uh, with the primary 3D uh, structure, these are tailored in a way that they become, uh, they can be installed in the, in the uh, shell uh, exactly. Uh, so basically, uh, this, these are the points where uh, the shell C um, get attached to the, to the outer shell. And this is the, all the three layers of the project the three shells. Uh, this is um, a representation of the unique space that we have uh, in the middle. And this is uh, the point view that we have on the top of the temple. We have started our uh, work process uh, with the inputs of the research, the context and the colony, which have allowed us to create the first designs and form exploration in Rhino and Grasshopper. After finding the main concept, we start to define the different uh, building parts and building components. And we introduced in an interoperability process between Rhino inside Revit, uh, Grasshopper and Rhino. That allow us to create documentation easily um, while uh, still uh, go back and uh, change, do changes on the design. Can you go next? 
like uh, spoken earlier, we sp uh, split the form into eight different layers, and these layers were also segregated into different streams so that all four contributors could um, contribute to the main channel. This uh, main channel was uh, split up into two main uh, two branches, the internal and the external branch. Um, in the following diagram, we can see how the plot stream is shared to contributor one and two, and then forwarded to contributor three and four to design the interiors of the temple. Um, the interiors and the exteriors of the temple are compiled into one main file and then pushed into Revit. And we also have an optimization loop in between on another stream where we could um, filter one portion of the model, one, one skin and um, push it back into Revit. Thank you. Really nice, guys. <clears throat> Can you leave it at the last uh, image, please? The other one, yeah. That's a good one. Um, and maybe, I, I don't know who would like to start the discussion uh, right now. Maybe. I'd like to ask a question. Um, I'm, I'm really intrigued about the brief of this uh, particular group, you know? Um, and I assume, you know, I haven't really thought about it myself. Uh, religious spaces in, in, in space. Um, and, you know, most of the time when I think about a space, it has to be multi-faith, because I think that's what you're trying to do. Is, it's a multi-faith space, right? Because people from all sorts of backgrounds uh, coming there together. Um, and I can't even think of a, a multi-faith space that is, that is interesting. Most of the time, these spaces are some blank boxes instead of airports, right? Um, so I'm kind of interested in your process, how you came to this design. Did you kind of, um, you know, uh, why you should it a little bit, but I'm kind of interested, like, did you speak to like a Muslim, a Protestant, a Catholic, Sikh, Hindu, you know, is that is that the way you came to this or how, like, how did your research actually come to this particular design? Um, can I take this? Yeah, so um, um, while looking at different uh, uh, religious places for like uh, diverse religions, uh, th there was a lot of intersections that we found within them, um, which we found also in what the sacred geometry was talking about. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to respect um, the, the rituals that are followed by different religions. So um, how we resolved this in our process was um, we, we wanted to focus on what intersected in all the religions, that is the, the, the understanding of a greater being, uh, the understanding of a collective consciousness that binds all of us together. So with that being in focus, uh, we, we also had a space dedicated, a flexible space dedicated to like different religions. So on um, level one, as we spoke, there was um, spaces that were meant for idol worship, spaces that were meant for prayer, and uh, spaces that were also met for, uh, meant for group gatherings, like how we have uh, Sunday services on, um, in the churches or how we have the namaz in, in a mosque and how we have a lot of uh, idol, idol worship in um, Hinduism. Um, and at the same time, having meditation in Buddhism. So all of those, um, all of those features are reacted to on, on one level, but um, we've tried to promote this entire point of how all of these ideas intersect into one main idea of just uniting everything. Um, we believe that uh, on earth, um, sometimes religious does um, help us quite a bit, but it also um, divides us sometimes. And that is what we didn't want to happen on the moon. Um, and hence we wanted to like create one space for um, a, un a universal space for all the beliefs that respect all the beliefs. I think, look, I think that's really interesting because even on the ISS, you still have the Russian part, the Americas part, the, the European, you know, it's super divided in the ISS, right? Still have their own systems and all that. So I think it's really good that you try to do this. Uh, one more question. Have the, are there any, besides this kind of like awful multi-faith rooms that you find in, in, in uh, airports, are there kind of examples of this in, um, you know, I think, for example, Hagia Sophia, that used to be a mosque and then became a church, so it was the other way around, right? First a church, then a mosque, then a museum. Um, are there other spaces in the world that we have like two religious sharing a space? Do you find that? Um, 
Um, absolutely. Um, in fact, the first reference that we shared was a temple that never got built. And that was supposed to be a temple that is shared by all the religions. Although there, there, are, um, there are spaces that are meant for uh, universal like practices, although they're not dedicated to multiple religions. Um, so if, if we want to, like we can show that reference from like slide four or five. Um, <laughs> Burning Man temples. Oh, the Burning Man, so, yeah, yeah. One of the things that I, I well, this uh, Burning Man seems to be a quite a, a sort of a big reference for this project. And I don't, I didn't, maybe it's because they've had Arthur as a, prof, as a teacher of them before uh, in the previous module uh, or not. But in the case, one of the things that I like, I mean, this, this discussion can become really controversial really fast, I think, when you start to think about, uh, you know, the things that we have in common, the things that we bring to space and the things that we want to leave behind no, in, in, into space. But one of the things that I like about this approach is that they have sort of taken like a mathematical approach to spirituality, you know, because they've, they've, they've derived the mathematical aspects of, of different references that they've had and they've sort of, sort of find this common ground into a, a, just a spiral geometry that rises up, which is something that if not uh, concerns directly to, you know, if it's, if it's not the common denominator within every religion that at least is is kind of an inspiration for human spiritual you know which, which i think no one can can deny in a way and it's a mathematical manifestation of this which in a way is the opposite of a religion because it's super rational and, and it's it's and i think it's it was if not if, i don't know if deliberate but it's a really it was really smart move from from these guys to to take in this uh rational rationalization of the of the spirituality in a way it did really, in fact, inspired a lot of interesting discussions in the within the studio. The uh, the fact that we were bringing a temple to the to the. No, no, I think it's super interesting to think about this. It's actually really well done to actually have that part of the brief. I think it's very uh, uh, interesting to do because suddenly, when we, I always kind of, you know, it's going back to the I says it. I still think it's odd that, you know, humans go into space and still we all wear a flag ah. of that that particular piece of land that particular spot on this globe that we come from you know like what do we need to do to kind of you know i always wonder if we go to mars are we still if we have a base there is it still going to be an american bit a european bit a russian bit even you look at antarctica we've split it up as a pizza slice right everybody has their own little bit like why is that so important that we all need to, you know, how do why do we identify ourselves in a way by which bit of land that we happen to be born on on the world, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. My, what do we? I mean, what? How many steps do we have to take backwards to find something that we have in common? But yeah. uh, in I think a this way, really interesting to to kind of tackle that 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 concept is really good, like that. I I like the mathematical approach to this because in a way. Mm -hmm. It's mathematical that also has brought us to space, no? So, you know, uh, I mean, computer science and engineering is all mathematically based. And I think it's, in a way, the serves this temple as a search of, because it, it, it became the central feature of the, of the positionally, even in the colony, it became a really central feature, no? And a monument to this, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> And maybe, and maybe exactly this typology has the possibility to kind of blur the differences. No, but mm. I think that's a good thing. Um, yeah, I want to also congratulate you for coming up with a very interesting brief. And I think the notion of uh, spirituality, not necessarily religion, is quite a good way of approaching it. And it's actually when you said sacred geometry it threw me back to something way way back when i actually started work <laughs> savi i don't know if you remember dushanka uh anyway I, this person gave me this very interesting book on sacred geometries and it's quite interesting because it's not about religion necessarily but it's about almost mathematics and how how mathematics was then used to 
convey religious messages, right? And and you see this quite well, you know, Christianity. I, I didn't know it's actually something that exists in other religions, but super interesting to find out that it is. And and you see how in uh, Christianity the the geometry start with the simple geometry, the primitives, right? And they represent certain features of uh, our gods, right? And how within them another inscribed geometry becomes an expression of themselves and through projection, it, it becomes quite cool. And I, I appreciate that you're looking into this. Now, a bit of more, okay, structural thinking. I actually, again, I'm a bit confused why you have two layers that don't work together. And it's funny because I have a religious reference that you can look at like gothic cathedrals they have an exterior skin and an interior skin but they work together <laughs> they do something clever to enable large spans and uh, i think you're missing that opportunity um in a way the whipped pattern i i'm assuming works quite well as a show and then you have this interior thing that probably wants to move and i wonder if you can brace it to make it a bit more stable and I also think you're totally ignoring the ground. It's almost like it magically sits on something. It, it's not, it's a large structure. It needs also a bit of thinking how it sits on the ground itself. Because if you propose such a large mass of volume, you will definitely move. And it's one of the things that took me a long time to understand in terms of structural thinking. So you see that most of the things that we build move. And we don't perceive the motion because they're large, right? But in reality, uh, a tower moves, even a house moves. And the trick is always how you make that motion, well, at least predictable. And I think it will help you as well to think of that. Okay, how do I ground such a large structure? Just as a thinking. And again, going forward, I wonder what you do next. So... I think you have a few avenues that you can explore. And I appreciate that you're looking into the 3D printing using multiple agents. And that could be something quite interesting to explore of this collaboration between the agents working to create the structure. I also think computationally you can do a bit more to make these geometries a, a bit more interesting. I, I think it's, it's one of the, I, I would say not convincing parts. I, I think you, you have a very almost Pierre Luigi nervy approach of, uh, and that's it. It's kind of like, I'll, I'll give you the triangles and the more simple path forces that I can give you. And I, I wonder if you can do a bit more to bring it to also a bit of today's structural thinking that not always equal and express that as well in your shape. So I wonder if as your structure becomes lighter, also the 3D printing changes to something else, and what that might be. So yeah, maybe you can look at that as well. Yeah, like uh, just to comment on the last part you mentioned, like we started off thinking of the approach, taking that taking a simpler approach. And then when like we thought of like integrating more details like into the form, uh, but then when we got to the material and the fabrication and 3D printing part of it, we somehow got a bit lost on, on, on the details of it. And, but for the future, maybe for the next step, maybe that would be uh, the uh, the approach that we would do where we have more details and more geometries going into the form itself but yeah in a way the simplicity that man that's manifested in this in this project also makes it uh, possibly the most feasible one because you need uh, you know without taking the, the enclosure away and being you know i like the 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 renders where you show people in suits actually going upwards. You no, know, you're you're not needing the to consider all, all of these aspects that are kind of embedded in the in the fact that you're wearing a suit. 
but definitely, I think you, you, you did the kind of struggle on making these uh, feasible and still there, like all, many of the other projects, there are, there are aspects that can definitely be addressed more with more time, of course. But uh, uh, and indeed, thanks for bringing up this, this super interesting discussion though, as well. Um, so um, with, with that said, I think, um, thanks guys. Uh, and we just, we have one more group and we are already a bit late and we're hoping that that the juries have uh, a minute more to spend with us so that we can see the last one which is a really also interesting one uh, and um, so i think without much further ado we, we can we can just jump in i don't know joao natalie and sergey you want to take it away yes this is a teaser this is a nice teaser uh, <laughs> already project. I will start. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go, go so shall, we, shall we start? Sure. Go okay, so hi everyone. We're group two, uh, Natalia Voinova, Joao Silva and me, Sergei Krichkov. And we're presenting our project of the solar water, uh, of the solar and water plant for the moon settlement. We have called it bombs and flowers and now we'll explain why. Our project occupies the highest position on the very edge of the crater because we're catching the low moon sun, uh, just one and a half degrees to the horizon, and our neighbors mustn't be shading it off. Our project is informed by the set conditions, which are quite extreme. On the moon's surface, there's no atmosphere, and there is, it is very cold in the shadow and very hot in the sunlight. The sun is the source of unlimited energy and harsh radiation at the same time. An obvious solution is to go underground where the temperature is constant and the regolith is the natural protection from radiation. It is extremely hard to dig caves on the moon, so we decided to nuke it instead. As there is no life there and the radiation from the sun is harsh anyway, exploding a few nuclear bombs wouldn't harm anyone. The absence of atmosphere makes the surface explosion safe because um, there will be no shock wave. The low gravity will ensure that the caves created by the underground explosions will not collapse. Um, we propose the following construction method. Blow a series of N bombs on and under the moon surface to create micro craters and caves, then clean and reinforce the surface, 3D scan them, and adjust the design to the actual shapes. Then connect the caves and craters with tunnels build the required structures on top and inside and start operation. We suggest using the parabolic and prismatic solar concentrators with mirror surface to collect the sun on the small solar pa panels and to redirect it on the ice to melt it. We intend to build a structure which will be used not only for the technical purpose but also provide the remarkable aesthetic experience to the settlers. The formal, the formal typology of the spaces and volumes we are creating reminds us about some archetypal examples. Yeah, well, something that was very important for us was, was the way that life was behaving in our site. So being close to the rim of the Shackleton crater was, was a must for sun exposure. And because there is no sunlight on the inner walls of the crater, it's believed that the ice there, there could be some ice reserves there. So we thought we could, besides harvesting the sun, also harvest ice and provide both to the colony. So we wanted to place ourselves at this imaginary line that starts the downward slope of the crater because it's the highest point, giving us maximum sunlight. And we also wanted to be the first stop for the ice that arrives. So our design is made up of different parts and bits that work together to accomplish the production, the storage and the delivery of the resources that we are processing. So for the biggest share of solar collection, we use three structures made up of, of solar panels. Marking the connection points between surface and underground, we use shells that encapsulate certain programmatic functions. And we have live shafts that direct sunlight to the underground circulation made up of tunnels and bomb caves. And as the central piece of our design, we have a water tank that's conceived as the main tourist attraction. And all these parts and bits work together to solve our program. You know, on the surface, other than the solar forest, there is an entrance shell, a monument shell, and a loading shell, each of them covering different spaces underneath, providing them with direct access to the surface and most importantly, lighting. 
and the other underground caves uh, are used for storage of, of the resources. Now the building is organized around the central piece, the water tank, and it's thought as a, as a monument to water where the ice slowly melts as it fills up the tank. Uh, the entrance on the left lets settlers go inside our caves, while the loading dock on the right lets robots bring fabrication materials inside. We wanted to reduce unnecessary circulation, so the elements are kept in a radial relationship to our central piece. And directly underneath each of those surface elements, we plan on different bomb explosions to create the necessary spaces. So the underground is sort of a, a dark cave-like industrial environment filled with moving containers of ice and batteries through the tunnels and occasionally marked by, by light sources. And the resources move from, from right to left from the fabrication going through the storages and being delivered at the entrance. And on the other hand, the settler circulation starts on the left on the entrance and slowly approaching the tank to admire the beauty of water, even if so far away from, from their home planet. And from this section, you can see how important it is to define these relationships between surface and underground spaces. But we also really wanted to optimize the different elements for solar goals, so of course, being a solar plant. So the first was to find the best orientation for the solar forest, but we also wanted to maximize the, the amount of light that we could bring underneath, and finally adapt the design to the topography. Um, but coming up with a real reliable sun path on the moon was no easy challenge. So we based ourselves on a model presented at the, the International Astronautical Congress. And from direct observation, we concluded that most of our sunlight would be coming from the top left, while 30% of the time would be shadowed by the mountain range uh, of the crater. We also tested our geometries, making sure it would perform on this objective of bringing the sun down. So the concave radial shape co coated with mirrors on the inside would bounce the, the, solar, the solar rays down, down. And finally, the immediate slope actually made us conceive these tree-like structures, you know, raised above the ground, enough that they can overcome the slope and catch the really low angles of, of the sun rays. And now we will show each element in detail and we'll start from the sun forest. It consists of mobile energy harvesting units. Each sunflower is capable of charging a battery. Its capacity depended on the size and number of concentrators. They may be owned by the moon settlers, forming the energy you bear for the colony. The starting point is a model of two different sizes. By association, we create a variation. Each one has a structural layer, a mirror surface layer, and two concentrators. Each tree will charge n numbers of batteries, depending on how many models it is made of. We imagine the forest as an integral part of the colony landscape, allowing for spontaneous charging in situ of rovers, batteries, and others. The entrance of the system of caves is a fully enclosed and habitable space with air and temperature adjusted to the comfort level. The connection point between settlers and our building. The shell provides the radiation protection where a spiral ramp takes us down to the accessing tunnel where the ordered materials are delivered. It is based on the micro crater created by explosion and the shell is built over it. Of the metal woven mesh covered with a thick layer of solid concrete made of the moon dust and urine. Here is another dynamic section showing the special organization of the structural layers. The entry gateway, uh, gateway interior. The shell over the biggest cave containing the water reservoir is an open structure. It is not intended for humans and its purpose is to catch the sun and redirect it onto the container with eyes in the middle and also on the transparent floor around it. It is assembled of the glass looks for prisms which redirect light further down into the cave. Here is the structure of ice melting machine and the tank. Water melted from ice is falling down and collects in the cistern. The aesthetic and symbolic aspects are extremely important. Water is the source of life, non-existent on the moon surface outside, except in the form of ice. Seeing the huge amount of water, the falling water, the troubled surface, hearing the sound of splashes, all this must become one of meaningful centers of the lunar community. Here is dynamic axinometric cutout of the monument cave. It shows the cave uh, created by explosion, the gallery around it, and the shell on the top. Another dyna uh, dynamic axonometric cutout shows the proportion of the space filled by water and light. This is the mirrored interior of the shell over the melting chamber, the black tablet in the middle, around to the Luxor floor. Here is the interior space of the monument. <clears throat> the key aesthetic experience is based on the play of light and the endless dynamic change of the forms <clears throat> of the huge water drops. 
slowly coming down from the melting box. Due to the low gravity, the drops will be bigger than the common rain. The shell of the fabrication cave is a lot in bell combined with a solar farm. Uh, it generates energy which is feeding the production directly uh, under it. The loading dock shell is basically a surface delivery station and it also powers the fabrication below and the lift in the shaft with the solar energy harvested on its surface. The tunnel lets ice and other materials be brought down for processing by robots. The structure inside the cave is made up <clears throat> of the water it is produced, produces modular containers filled with materials, which are then moved into the storages. It has three working platforms for robots and a central corridor for circulation. Here is the interior view of the fabrication shell focused on the delivery shaft. And now we'll speak a little bit about the storage caves. Uh, we tried to mimic a real explosion. So we create a model based on the expansion of an initial void by the collision of particles moving outwards with an explosion force. And this model allowed us to play with the number of bombs and their respective shapes that they were producing. Um, we always start by an initial explosion that creates a spherical cavity, and we then add more bombs to extend this cavity and try to design by explosion. It was a lot of a very fun process. And this experiment gave us a, a catalog of many iterations by varying three parameters. And since in reality, these this produced shapes are kind of unpredictable, it was a matter of choosing the ones that best suited our needs and, and always design a flexible solution that would work for, for any shape. So we decided to articulate this unpredictability with a, a rational organization of the storage by, by overlaying it with a grid. And this grid is made up of cubic containers that, that store the resources. We also crossed this approach with a structural analysis of the cave itself, which revealed some weak points that needed to be reinforced. So we thought that the aggregation of these modular containers as a, a structural element in itself, reinforcing the cave's uh, weak points. Still, this tree will be in a, a constant state of change as the containers that make it up arrive and leave the cave as requested. So the concept was really about generating branches that spread out to the surface of the cave and then use those paths to guide the assembly of the containers. And these containers move through tunnels in a cable car system attached to the ceiling. Each, each container can have either ice blocks or charged batteries. And this modular approach kind of solves the problem of both storing and circulation. And here's an interview view of, of how this storage cave tree would look like. Um, okay, uh, now we'll have a closer look at the fabrication technologies. Uh, regolith is the main source to produce the materials we need for construction. We can extract silica to produce mirror surfaces, uh, which through reflection will allow to transform ice into water. Aluminum and titanium will be used for structural grid of the shells and water conducts. With a mix of urine, we can make concrete uh, for the radiation proof layer uh, uh, of the moon dust. Uh, and finally, with electrolytes, we can produce solar cells. Um, here's the uh, construction sequence. Uh, uh, on the timeline. First, uh, the bearing mesh is erected by the weaving robot uh, of the titanium, uh, titanium bar. Then the structure for the radiation protection layer is printed over it and backfilled with the moon dust. Then it is covered uh, by the sealing external layer of compressed and burned moon dust. And the final step is the interior finish, which is printed on the metal surf structure from below. Uh, and now, um, a few words on uh, some presentation uh, technologies that we also experienced over this project. Uh, the nature of our project being largely underground provides some difficulties in demonstrating its overall spatial qualities. We wanted to push the boundaries of the conventional design presentation over the web. Uh, and our idea was to give the audience the opportunity to examine our project for different, from different points of view, following their own scenario. We can walk through it, fly around it, and zoom into every corner. Uh, the single click on every object brings out its name and short description, and the second click makes the external skin invisible and reveals the interior. And the link to this uh, on the GitHub uh, 
is uh, probably already in chat. Uh, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Um, Sergey, the, the link was not in the chat. So if you. Oh, was it? Uh, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll post it now. Post it. That would be great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, comment, comment, uh, congratulations for being the first uh, group that finishes four time. <laughs> Great. Uh, it was actually quite concise and quite interesting. I think this is a very innovative uh, and daring project. And I would like to, to, to hear what the space experts uh, think about this as well as from the BIM side. The space first <laughs> as you want as you want um i was wondering like um i was listening to it have you guys done a kind of a um, an, an analysis like so why did you come to the uh solar collector to kind of create energy that, that was my first question um so have you done like an analysis of kind of all the different ways on how to you could create energy on the moon um that's my first thing my second question is um have you taken into consideration clearly the um yes you have different temperatures you have the ice uh, but you also work in a vacuum right like one of the things the experiences i had myself is when we did a 3d printing for european space agency um in a vacuum, and we actually tried it out in the vacuum, our liquid that we used would have been evaporated immediately because of the vacuum. So we actually had to pre-print underneath the regolith almost. So the, the chemical reaction happened before the liquid evaporated off. So I'm kind of wondering, have you done like the, 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 the physics as well of uh, the melting and all that? Does it, does it, have you kind of like double checked all that? Um, uh, that, that, was, that was my second question. You know, have, have you done your, your, your physics? Um, yeah, feel free to respond, guys. Yeah, well, um, the, the, honest, the honest answer would be no and no, because, uh, of course, uh, we've done some research, but uh, honest, uh, we didn't didn't go uh, as deep as uh, as you have because uh, for us it was uh, like a three month exercise and uh, of course it's uh, we only touch the surface and we we understand it quite well. Um, we uh, we have made an assumption that concentrators uh, would be a good solution uh, because um, uh, we wanted to uh, well. Again, another honest confession would be that uh, our design uh, is not only uh, function or site conditions and forms, uh, because we believe that uh, form is not function, but form is form. And we did have an idea that having those uh, sunflowers um, would be a nice image. I mean, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have meant to touch in the touch it in the presentation, but probably didn't. Uh, we do believe that um, the aesthetics of, uh, of the structures on the moon are important for the mental health of the colony, that uh, the, uh, the human being uh, has a need for, uh, for aesthetics. He has a need for art. Uh, otherwise, uh, we wouldn't have created it um, as, a, uh, as a special, right? So uh, to... Um, to meet this need, to meet this demand, uh, we thought that um, the uh, the symbolical message and the formal message um, inside uh, the things that we design is not least important than the practicality, right? So uh, we knew that um, harvesting the sun and using the sun concentrator is one of the possible ways to uh, to get energy, and it gave us the opportunities to. Uh, to make to make a fancy thing, so the combination of these two uh, was the driver for the design, not only the uh, the physics. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that you haven't really stressed enough, which has always been part of your project in, in your presentation. That it's always been a kind of a negotiation in between the 
poetry of uh, of the references that you had and the poetry of of, of um, kind of a like a light experience and and going around water and also the more engineering or technical aspect of, of, of collecting sound. Well, we, we we definitely wanted to go for the sci-fi uh, approach here because um, our brief was very was very. Um, raw in a sense that it's an infra piece of infrastructure that's supposed to collect the sun and power batteries. Uh, and that's very simple to do, but we, we wanted to, to push more the aesthetic experience of how the resources can actually be performative and, and um, how that can introduce a, a certain level of interest uh, in the project. So we definitely took some assumptions uh, as far as underground, we would still have gravity so that the waterfall uh, would work. Um, and the, the sound concentrators were, um, well, it's, a, it's a funny reference from, a, it, there was a Portuguese priest that designed the first uh, solar concentrator and we, we thought it was a, a very interesting uh, invention. Uh, so, so we took all these things that really aesthetically really uh, pushed us to create this kind of parallel reality of, of what it could be uh, to have it in the moon. Um, well, one Honestly, more thing, thing. excuse me. I honestly think you should be a bit more honest with yourselves and to other people if you if you want to be really taken a bit more serious. I actually I picked up this quote from a actuary. So the director actually, Fernan, said the architecture is the most beautiful solution to a non-existent problem. <laughs> so in a way, I don't know, just be honest and say, look, I like these shapes. I made them because I find them pretty. I don't think like wrapping or pseudoscience around it helps you. I, th I think that's and, uh, what we're saying. Yeah, well, <laughs> you took a very long answer to say that. But um, also, I actually appreciate the computation, even though it's pseudoscience, it doesn't matter. A lot of things come out of play. Um, and actually, some of the biggest inventions came out of literally play. And there's a great book for this, um, Wonderland by uh, Steven Johnson, I think. But anyway, it's fine, go play. But um, <laughs> the whole, the whole pseudoscience is, is a bit not helping. But look, there are some scientific things and I appreciate them. So I like when you're using sun axis to drive some of the geometry, but then it fails when you see like, well, wait a second, it's all symmetrical. The sun doesn't move very symmetrical. And also your planet or moon is not exactly placed perfectly. So it generates a perfect symmetrical form. Um, actually, I think the place where you got really honest were the caves. And I actually, that's where I, I looked at it and I loved it. It was like, okay, that's an amazing computation. I'm like trying to simulate how explosions create space. That's a very clever way of doing things. Like, I don't mind it. Like for me, I, as a designer, as an architect, it's just a different type of pen, right? It's a different type of uh, tool. It's, uh, you know, how Maya people made uh, Zaha looking buildings, right? And uh, uh, I don't know, uh, the new generation of uh, discrete people, which use uh, combina combinatorics and algorithms create discrete architecture. It's fine, it's a choice, right? It's a choice of two. And you say, okay, I, I really like what it outputs. And again, for me, the strongest designers even Hernan, who was the, one of the first Maya person, I appreciate him because he makes these grotesque looking buildings and he says, you know, I like them. And there is someone who likes them too, so willing to pay for one of those to be made. So that's fine. I think it's just a different tool, but yeah, don't, don't try to add things on top to make it more than it is. Yeah. Is I, there think, actually? Um, I think one of the things you have to give now and then because when you come when you come from both aspects, like trying to trying to uh, reach a perform certain performance where you which you can which you have to evaluate, you know, and that's more like the engineering uh, performative side, and you would probably end up with very flat, uh, you know, very very distributed panels that don't add up to this uh, type of narrative, no. 
and and if you would have come out coming from the other aspect as well but then then also you in a way have complete freedom of design which doesn't constrain you to anything so that's why i think the the this project in a bit lies in between and and i think that you're right one has to be kind of uh explicit about this negotiation not trying to claim one or the other no but in in a way uh trying to satisfy a bit of both um i think this may be a longer a bigger discussion in a way but I, I i personally do believe there is a position where you um you know if you follow the science and the engineering completely um i i, I do not believe there's 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 solutions out there that what I mean is you, you don't you don't always get driven into a very box standard solution then I think you know following the engineering the science gives you a certain solution space that follows physics and 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 and, and certain things but within that it's our role as architects and designers to uh, find the most elegant one and the most beautiful one but that's still you know, uh, sits within the solution space that is kind of optimum and functional and, uh, you know, for the physics. So um, I, I, I don't believe this kind of, I don't believe this kind of two sides to it and you find kind of a balance. I think there is actually an area within that you can find, um, you know, ideal, ideal points for that. I think that you put it in a much better way, of course, than, than I have. Yeah, that's right. It's a it's a certain space, uh, you know, and someone has to make the call out for the decision of where you place yourself in the project now, in the in within that space. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so because engineering doesn't give you an optimum solution, but science and engineering does not give you an optimum solution alone. That it doesn't do that, right? There's so many ways to kind of resolve something um i think that you can still you know i think be very strict and space is a very kind of that's why i love working in space because it's so strict it's so restrained being able to find a great solution within that really kind of confined you know design solution space is is really satisfying i think yeah and i think a good parallel for this is high performance cars so I don't think anyone goes and says a Ferrari is ugly, right? But quite a lot of it um, is also exactly the fact that it has a lot of engineering thinking and sure. then design comes to complement it in a, in a way that even emphasizes the engineering in a way. But And it's actually beautiful architecture, I think, does the same. And <laughs> you guys are in Barcelona, you have the master of it, right? If you walk and you see Gaudi, it's uh, amazing, like the expression of the structure into form and how it's working. I think that that's incredible. And yeah, great masters of architecture seem to do that very well, and at least in my opinion. Uh, Jules, what, what do you have to say about, mm -hmm. about this? Uh, and first of all, thank you for the presentation, of course. Um, I'm uh, maybe I'm I'm going a bit into the the technical part and how maybe the workflow was because you didn't really um, show that part in in detail. Like, um, did you use uh, how what what software and what workflow did you use? How did you get the geometries that you created, or especially maybe the bomb forms? How did you evaluate them? Because I like this kind of approach you now, because you have you can have certain optimization parameters and then like feed them into uh, whatever computational process that you might get like uh, based on the optimization criteria you get. You can evaluate them and then how do you how do you uh, put that then into your BIM software and have your like, like documentation made from that? Yeah. Um... Just like the other groups, um, in terms of collaboration, we're using Speckle and and then pushing everything into 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 Revit with Rhino Insight. Um, we kind of left it out because we wanted to focus more on on the on the architecture that we were trying to show here. But I'm glad to answer. Um, the caves are are kangaroo simulated, 
So it's we're using these particles to to collide with the mesh. Um, then we play with that to to get to to the ones that we wanted to use. And of course, in reality, would three D scan the the actual bones that would show up and then push it back to to change the designs. Um, and then we use, we're using Caramba to, to do the structural analysis and, and uh, ladybug tools to, um, for the solar solar path. And how, how do you like evaluate the bomb shapes in the end? Like what was the, the, the criteria that you used? Was it computational or was it more like, was it the volume that they created or like the shape or no. how many boxes would fit? Or? Because because we knew it was a, a very uh, it was an exercise with a lot of freedom because we couldn't our, even our model was not so uh, scientific to to see how these bombs would, would be like it was a matter of creating a catalog and choosing a few of those and do the structural analysis on that and then with the trees the idea of the tree was that from the caramba analysis we pick those the the um, the fragile points that caramba was showing us to to create the trees. Okay. Not sure I was, I was very clear. But but the, the caves themselves, they were mostly there to kind of have these boxes uh, stored or... Yeah, they were, they were just stored. The program for these caves is storage. Yeah. Now, kind of like the, the sea, yeah. you know, it's like a place to protect all these resources as the colonies is taking them. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, this project has certainly uh, promoted a really interesting discussion also, I think. And, um, and maybe for the interest of time, you also left some of the technical aspects uh, aside, like uh, Joao was mentioning. The form finding of the, of the, the form finding through, through explosions in itself, it's kind of an interesting topic. Uh, even without the lunar agenda, because it would be in such an unpredictable um, technique. It's such an unpredictable uh, way to do, to to come out about this, but also the yeah I mean uh, the all of the aspects that, that kind of touch this subject the, this uh, the technical uh, part of this project I think I would have enjoyed seeing them a bit more into detail as well like uh, the part, if, if more about talking about more the particle systems or the voxel approach that you took into into the trees uh, structural trees. But of, uh, I think, as with many of the other projects, one has to choose in, in, in into which direction you want to drive the discussion towards, and that's that's always the direction that you are more probably more inclined into now. And um, in general, there's uh, there has been situations with uh, throughout all of the groups, throughout uh, many instances of the studio where we had to kind of with a lot of uh, sorrow leave interesting aspects behind like i said in order to fulfill the brief of the in, for the sake of completion pretty much for the sake of carrying out the, the projects to a level of detail which we we would be able to to document and feel the challenge of 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 the, the beam challenges now the, the one that the ones that we discussed in the beginning about interoperability and intercollaboration and also and um, making our projects <clears throat> that are complex projects, as you've seen, uh, taking the last one also as a great example of something quite complex into something that can become uh, communi communicated uh, eventually through plans, through uh, you know the way that we communicate projects. Some of these probably would, would, would have never ended up being plans, but more directly being G codes for the fabric for the robot or, or being, uh, you know, uh, maybe generative algorithms for the swarm robots to, to build and never have such a pres prescriptive approach. But I think the fact that we have uh, faced these challenges uh, kind of makes us aware of the, of the shortcomings of the tools that we're using. And especially also that the, the designs that we, that the way that we design cannot be driven by the, by the shortcomings of the tools, but more of these kind of high level discussions that we just had that we we have had with the uh, uh, you know throughout all, within all of the groups I think no which are, to me are are more interesting are, are much more interesting and enriching and in a way those should be the ones that form and push our tools and and 
I think one of the things that are proud uh, that we were more, more most proud about this this uh, studio is that we've learned also to shape our tool our own tools and and um, we're learning to to make our own tools for for to so that the high level purpose that we have for projects doesn't get uh, kind of cut out because we just cannot communicate our project now. So um, with that said, I think I, I, I have to say with this group and the, and the previous group, we couldn't be more proud about the, the, the level of work, the level of engagement that the students have had throughout the, the studio. The, it, it would have been nice for you guys to take a tour throughout our Slack channel and see how many discussions we, we had, how many different aspects we had, how many different ideas we could have explored and develop and kind of have like a, an overview of the decision map of, of all of the things that we had to leave behind to uh, to this point. But I think it's quite, it's been quite obvious from these presentations that the, the projects at uh, this stage uh, encompass a lot of complexity, not only formal, but also in terms of, of this, no, of, of the of the different aspects that they that they touch. Um, so uh, I think the, a big round of applause to the students. Uh, as I said before, this would be the time where we where we go and uh, you know shut down our computers, uh, go and have a beer in the bar, and 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 you know just celebrate about this. And when when we we will have a, a virtual beer probably afterwards, if you will. But um, that does I mean that doesn't. Uh, that doesn't kind of kill the fact that we are really proud about the projects and we can, we're definitely celebrating them all together here. And thanks a lot for the juries for also for, for uh, bringing in such an interesting discussion to the projects of some aspects that of course, being a, kind of a closed design studio, some, some stuff we cannot, uh, you, we always cannot see now that we, we lose the perspective sometimes being so much in focus of the, and so much in depth of, the, of these aspects that we're tackling. Um, I don't know if it's just me, but I'm seeing uh, Octavian already, you know, sideways from seeing so many projects, uh, so many lunar projects. I think so it's intended. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, probably one of the, you know, one of the, <laughs> one, <laughs> one of the, uh, yeah, results of, of being in these types of discussions. You 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 become kind of sideways. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Julian, uh, Xavier, Octavian. Uh, Kike, who was here in Srinka, also thanks a lot for your comments and for spending some time with us. It was, it was really interesting, and I would like to kind of congratulate everyone and um, on on the work and you know doing this all remotely. You know that is not uh, that is not easy. Um, so, and also I think the, the 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 setup of the program I think is quite quite interesting. It's very challenging. You know, in such a short period of time, having to do actually do design in not a, such an uh, easy environment you know you have to learn a lot about uh, how you design and build and on the moon and and on top of that of course uh, one of the core things of this course is being able to kind of use all these tools uh, computational and BIM tools so uh, to get your head around that I think that's that's, that's pretty amazing um, so yeah congratulations everyone on that thank you thank yeah, you very we, much it was, was very was very fun to listen to this presentations and I also think with these kind of tools and these workflows you're tackling things that are you know upcoming in the industry I mean the industry is way behind what you're doing there at the moment and uh, I think it's a it's a it's a very interesting and and good thing to tackle and, and, and challenging and I was impressed what 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 came out of each and every project yeah, I'll, uh, I'll uh, for the congratulations and maybe it's not enough stated, but it's quite inspiring to see the young generation doing so much. And actually, I realize in the short time you've done quite a lot, so that's incredible. And I I know it's not easy. Probably everyone is stuck at home in bedroom, or if you're lucky, you might have a an office space to work from. So it's even more impressive. And yeah, go out, celebrate, have a bit of fun, go for a run or eat something very nice. <laughs> I don't know how to celebrate in these conditions, but well done. And, uh, looking forward to see when you come into the profession, how you bring your knowledge. And be courageous because the offices change slow. So sometimes we need a 
a bit of this um, younger generation to push us forward. So don't fall into the trap when you start to be a professional architect of doing things the way things are done. Yeah, and no, I agree with Octavia. Keep pushing, you know, because it's really in, in bigger offices as well. It's it's become people like you coming in, having tried new things that need to push it, you know. So I would uh, encourage everyone to keep pushing wherever you go. I think that's a great piece of advice. And in a way, it kind of encapsulates the spirit of, of, of MACAD. So I think it's a good, uh, those, are, those are good words to, to end up the, the transmission. Uh, so I know on our mission control, can we, shall we? Sure, <laughs> th thank you all for joining and thanks to the jury for all the uh, great feedback and amazing comments. Thanks to all the students for pushing the, the agenda of this um, research studio, not only on the research of uh, BIM workflows, as was intended, but also on the research on uh, space project, which is a, a nice addition and surprise as well. And um, yeah, I think uh, as in MACAD, we fully embrace this remote um, the remote and distributed way of uh, learning and doing things. I think we can all have a remote uh, beer party right now <laughs> to celebrate. No, no, without uh, without any recordings, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so with this, I will close the live feed and the recordings.